Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Mike has got the week off. It's me, Leo Laporte, and Ask the Tech Guys. Coming up, Sam, <laughs> I'm Bull Sam at our car guy, answers the question, can Toyota really come up with a 785-mile electric vehicle battery that charges in just 10 minutes? Also, trouble-free frolicking with Dick DiBartolo and the world's largest bubble gun, and then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about some very geeky topics, including using a Raspberry Pi for ham radio and SSHing into your myth box. If you don't know what that means, stay tuned. Ask the Tech Guy is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Ask the Tech Guys with Leo Laporte, episode 1989, recorded Sunday, August 27th, 2023. Trouble-free frolicking. Ask the Tech Guys is brought to you by Cashfly, delivering content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and 30% faster than other major CDNs. Join Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN, for a limited time. Cashfly is offering a free 5 terabyte tier plan. For other plans, learn how to get your first month free at cashfly.com. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? It's time for Ask the Tech Guy. No, uh, because our dear friend Micah Sargent is out today, but that's all right. I'll take care of it. I used to do this show all by myself for about 19 years. Uh, this is the show where we answer your questions help you understand what's going on with your computer. There's uh, three different ways you can reach us. Two of them are live. You can use Zoom. We kind of thought this would be the, the Zoom show. You know, that would be the big difference from the radio show is that you could go to and do this on your phone, call.twit.tv. And if you did that, then uh, your Zoom would launch and your microphone would work and your camera would work because you have a phone. And you'd be on with us uh, in Zoom. And sometimes some people still do that. Although almost everybody does it from their computer, even though I keep saying do it from your phone. You can also phone. If you want a phone phone, phone 888-724-2884. And you're still going in the Zoom, but you won't know it. You'll hear a nice little welcome, and then we'll put you in the lobby so you'll be here in the show. And then when you come on the air, is it star six? They press to unmute. I think the instructions will explain it. You can also email atg at twit.tv. And I understand we have a stack of upside-down email. He told me, John Ashley, producer producer man John Ashley said, would you just read the gosh darn email? Well, uh, I've been pi it's been piling up. Too many emails, but so many Too questions. many emails. You know who's coming up in just a little bit? Dickie D, Dick D. Bartolo. He's going to join us at noon or one, you said. I think. Noon. Noon, okay. And this is the new Mad Magazine. See, Wednesday, and uh, Wednesday's Alfred E. Newman. And the funny thing is, Cousin It, or I'm sorry, that's the thing, isn't it? Is, no, uh, has that's, his finger that's up. the thing. That's and the if thing. you look closely, you can see all the different iterations of the Adams Family over the years. Yeah, I like that. Starting with the original cartoon from Charles Adams. That's pretty cool. Anyway, we'll talk to Dickie T about his gadget or gizmo of the week. Uh, and, of course, lots of your calls. Oh, and don't forget, 1 p.m., Sam. Oh, and Sam Abul Sam at our car guy at 1 p.m. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So there's a really interesting story I've been watching develop over the last few months. A few months ago, there was a story saying something weird is going on in Solano County, which is Near us, it's about an hour away uh, to the east of us, People, somebody, some mysterious person is buying up the land, and it was around Travis Air Force Base. So there was some people, some concern. They're buying up the land around the Air Force Base. Maybe it's the Chinese. You know, so if somebody bad happens, it used to be, remember in the, uh, in the old days, it used to be the Soviets, <laughs> the Ruskies. Then it was the Arabs, and now it's the Chinese. It isn't the Chinese. 
It's the new villain, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, Reed Hoffman, who you may know from LinkedIn, he's one of the PayPal mafioso, Mike Moritz, and others have bought up, I think it was 85,000 acres, $800 million worth of land around Travis Air Force Base. There's Mark Andreessen, uh, also one of them, Chris Dixon. So the company is Flannery Associates. And I think when the news started to bubble around that it might be the Chinese or some foreign nation state doing it, Flannery finally said, yeah, we better, uh, we better tell people. But this started, believe it or not, six years ago. Mike Moritz was going around saying, uh, hey, hey, fellow billionaires, fellow, fellow kids, would you like to buy some land <laughs> in the San Francisco Bay Area for cheap? Solano County is undeveloped. It's mostly agricultural. Uh, it's kind of, you know, arid land. Um, they have been buying it up in the last six years. $800 million they've spent. What you may ask, what do they, what, what are they thinking? Is it, is it investment in America's food infrastructure? You know, Bill Gates is the number one landowner in, in the, uh, the U.S., because of that, right? He wants to buy up farmland because he figures that's going to be valuable. No, no. This was the brainchild, according to the New York Times, of a guy named Jan Schremek, a former Goldman Sachs trader who thought up the idea, here's what we're going to do. Silicon Valley will buy up these arid, dry, brown hills in this rural area and convert it into the city of the future. Ooh. As soon as I heard that, I thought, I'm going to live there. Tens of thousands of residents, clean energy, public transportation, a dense urban life. And part of this is because it's so expensive to buy a house or a land in the, in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. All these Silicon Valley people are suffering. So this guy goes around, talks to some of the billionaires out there. Mike Moritz is a big VC. Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn. Mark Andreessen, who created the Netscape browser and... You know, he's got his own VC firm, Chris Dixon. Why do I know the name Chris Dixon? I feel like Chris Dixon is associated with Kevin Rose somehow. I don't know. Uh, Patrick and John Collison, they founded Stripe. There's the, there's the, there's this two, the brother. Lorene Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow. Anyway, this is this is so Silicon Valley. We, you know, we know how to make a utopia on Earth. All we need is the land. So they have it. Uh, we'll see what they do with it. Part of the problem is it is not zoned for residential, it's zoned agricultural. So the very first thing they're going to have to do is convince the state or the county, I guess it's the county. Uh, can we build a city here? And by the way, $800 million, that's just the land. It's going to be billions, right, to build a city on this land. That's you know, There's a two-lane freeway leading to it, and that's it. So... Uh, <laughs> Has nothing to do with Travis Air Force Base. I bet you they thought this will be one of the bases to be closed someday, and then we can buy that. Now we really have some. The problem was, you know, these the the, the, the farmers who were selling this land were making some some bank because they started to realize, you know, if somebody's buying this up, we should raise the price. So they were coming in with offers four to five times market. Uh, so, you know, the farmers obviously sold multimillionaires are being created, but no one knew what was going on. So it was last week that Flannery finally <laughs> stepped up and said, yeah, it's us. Yeah. We're going to make, we're going to have 10,000 acres of a new city, tens of thousands of homes, a large solar energy farm, orchards with a million new trees, make it 1 billion and over 10,000 acres of new parks. In open space. Uh, okay, good luck. <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> they get these nutty ideas. And actually, in some ways, I admire them because they read a lot of sci-fi. And so they're trying to create some sci-fi utopia. And we all kind of believe in that, right? Let's go to Mars and stuff. But at the same time, you know, reality does eventually set in. I, I guess they got the money to lose. This is bad news uh, from the tech dirt. It is, it's very unclear what can happen to you when you cross the border, whether you're a U.S. citizen or not, into the United States. 
it seems to be that law enforcement, the Border Patrol, has the right to strip search you and download the contents of all your hardware and, you know, anything they want. That the, the Fourth Amendment, the, uh, the right to unreasonable search and seizure without due cause, is m null and void on the, on the border. In 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that you had to have a warrant to search somebody's phone. That the phone is precious because everything is in our, in our life is there. Uh, but now the fifth, uh, the fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has confused everything. A immigration lawyer named Adam Malik crossed the border and uh, without probable cause, law enforcement, the Border Patrol, took his phone, downloaded everything from it. He said, wait a minute, I'm an attorney. There is privileged communications on there. You can't, you can't have that. Um, they kept it for the phone and the data for months, eventually appointed somebody to delete those, the client, attorney client privilege stuff. Uh, the DHS seized the phone without probable cause. We talked about this story when it happened. He was, the attorney was very upset. Um, they held it for five months. Imagine if you cross the border and you, they take your laptop, your phone, all your hardware and keep it. And then give it back to you, but have kept all the data that was on it. Fifth Circuit says, you don't need a warrant to do that. That's okay. The court decided in favor of the DHS ruling it had not violated Attorney Malik's rights with his search of his phone. <sighs> so I wish I could tell you um, whether... You should worry about this when you cross in the United States. If you travel, you know, to Mexico or Canada or anywhere in the world and you come back in the U.S., it really does seem like DHS and the Customs and Border Patrol are going to assert their rights, if they wish, to search your phone. They don't need probable cause to even keep your devices. People I've talked to, advocates of uh, privacy and security, say never, ever, <laughs> never bring anything private across the border because of that. And I don't know what the rules are going into other countries, but we know the rules going to the U.S., it looks like probably in all likelihood, even though the courts are kind of disagreed back and forth on this, uh, you, you could be searched and your stuff could be seized. And that's it. Bye bye. Don't, you know, do not phone home. Do not pass go. Do not collect your $200. Um, YouTube is testing. <laughs> we talked about this on Twig. A, a new button. You know, there's a skip ads button on YouTube videos. Maybe if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see that. It's, they're testing a really small one. <laughs> it's too big, too obvious. Gets in the way of your video. So they're <laughs> going to try a little small one. This is funny because YouTube for years has said, oh, no, no. Advertisers love the skip ads button because it they don't want to show an ad to somebody who doesn't want to see it. And it gives them information about you and 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 what you're interested in. And so, oh, don't worry about that. Advertisers love it. Well, maybe they don't love it. Or maybe YouTube doesn't love the loss of revenue because <laughs> we're going to make it really hard to see now, just in case. All right. The phone number, 888. Show me the phone because I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> there it is, 724-2884. See, it's on the screen if you're watching the video. Leo doesn't know it. I should memorize it. It's it's it spells something, right? Eight 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 seven call eight. I think when you started doing that, the first thing you were you were just taking up random suggestions. I was making things up. You're making things up or taking suggestions. That's from why the I'm chat. confused now. Yeah. I don't know. Eight 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 seven two four two eight eight four. That's the number. I want to take a call. You should tell me, though, which one I should take, Mr. Producer Man. Uh, should I do Kevin or no. Peter? Let's do, let's do uh, Peter. Peter. Peter has his hand up. Yeah. All right, Peter, come on down. Bob Barker passed away at the age of 99. That's a good life he had. He had a good life. 99. It was days short of his 100th birthday, the host of Let's Make a Deal and the Price is Right. Hello, Peter. How are you in our Stargate? First time, long time, as we used to say. Love Leo, that. Good to talk to you. Welcome. <laughs> so, Leo, 
few years back, um, uh, I gave up video games because, you know, wife and kids, responsibilities. But then my son got this Batman Arkham Asylum game. Uh oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I have to play these games. It's know? a great game. That's a really fun yeah. game. But then I wanted to play all of them. Yeah. City, you know. So I did a very sneaky thing. I convinced my wife it was time for a new Macintosh computer. I know that's not ideal for gaming, but I had a whole plan. And I uh, <clears throat> I got one that I knew the specs would work for the games. I then got uh, Boot Camp. Oh, you're running in Windows. That's my smart. Hard drive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got Steam, you know, yeah, the whole, did the whole yeah. thing. So you basically then, you got a PC in Mac form. That's right. And I also was getting away for it. But let me give some advice to everybody out there. The the day your wife finds a hidden partition on the computer, <laughs> you immediately have to fess up. And yeah, yeah. Don't everything. yeah, don't pretend that you, you know, because she's gonna assume the worst. Honey, I'm just it's me <laughs> and uh and what's uh, it's not not the Joker. Uh what's the what's the uh attractive young lady? Oh, uh, Harley oh, Quinn. Harley Quinn. Just me and Harley, Harley Quinn. Quinn. Uh voice actress passed away recently. I know she just died. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Harley Quinn and I making a haha. -ha, That's say. it. <laughs> so anyway, um, we had a good run, but my computer is now getting old. I'm gonna have to get a new back computer, as I call it. Yeah. And I don't. My question for you, I kind of have like two. One's quick, and one's a little more involved, maybe. But is boot camp still a thing? If no. I get a new computer, so what do I do? So boot camp was a thing when they were Intel's. Uh, and it was an easy thing to do because you basically were buying the same hardware as a PC. So all Apple had to do is provide drivers for Apple's, you know, hardware that was proprietary. Uh, but the chip was the same. And so you could run, in fact, Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal famously said, the best PC, <laughs> the best Windows PC is a Mac. Those days are long gone. Once the uh, Apple Silicon started coming out, there really was no way to do boot camp anymore. And Apple has made no attempt to do it. You can run windows and emulation but even then it's not going to be intel windows it's going to be windows and arm and it does run quite well in parallels but most of those games will not run because they are intel games right so probably if you really want to keep playing steam games you should get a pc now i don't i don't you know me i'm not a huge windows fan so at home i actually run linux on my high-end gaming pc and because of the Steam Deck, a lot of Steam games do run well on Linux. Not all, but I'm running Baldur's Gate 3, for instance, the hot new uh, RPG. Uh, I run that on Linux, even though it doesn't say it can play on when Linux. It plays fine. So um, you probably should get a PC. I hate to say it. I, but for gaming, the Mac is not ideal. I, I understand. And even, I hate to, I don't, you probably weren't getting the best performance even with Arkham Asylum. Because, yeah. You weren't using NVIDIA cards. You know, if you if your fancy Mac happened to have a Radeon, well, the graphics were okay, but it's going to always look better. That's why when I want to do PC gaming, I bought a PC because that's really how you have to do it. The other option that you might want to look at is buying an Xbox. Cheaper, easier. You don't have to figure out how to get Windows working or Linux working or any of that stuff. You just buy the disc, you know, the game. You don't even buy a disc anymore. You just buy the game, download it, and play it. And, uh, and the modern Xbox is 4K, PlayStation 5 yeah. maybe, depending on, on which games you want to play. Uh, Sony is notorious for having exclusives, so uh, yeah. Microsoft a little less so, but but uh, you should look at what games you want to play. Uh, Arkham Asylum, for instance, is available on Xbox. My son has uh, an Xbox, but yeah. my obsession has even led me into the modding world. Ah, so uh, mods, yeah. PC world, you could mod. Yeah, you can't really do mods. Or... Yeah, you can't do much on uh, on an Xbox, but a PC. So okay. you kind of need Fair a enough. PC. I hate to say can I, it. Can I ask one follow-up question? Yeah. With with the hunt for a new computer, too, the other kind of old-timey thing was, you know, every time I would get a new computer for all my life, I'd get one with, like, twice as much hard drive space. Right. But now that hard drives are, are no longer spinning their SD, it seems like it might be cost prohibitive. So if I want no. to get like a two terabyte drive. No, here's the good things. news. SSD prices have tumbled. So okay. they're not much more expensive than spinning drives. And they're much better. Just don't, don't get one from Western Digital. That's all. Because <laughs> they have some <laughs> issues. But uh, yeah. uh, don't get those SanDisk SSDs. We talked about that last week. But uh, no, I would. No, absolutely. An SSD. I get all of my computers now with a two terabyte SSD. 
Two terabytes is about 150 bucks. Oh, that's great. Yeah, much cheaper than they used to be. Uh, incredibly cheaper. And, uh, you know, there were some concern from people, and even Steve Gibson echoes this still to this day, about SSDs being less uh, reliable over the long run, like they wear out faster. And that's not been my experience at all. In fact, I would say SSDs we're going to see in the long run are more reliable. They have different kinds of failures, but they don't have the physical failures as spinning drives have. I think SSDs absolutely, and it's much, much faster, much, absolutely the way to go. Yeah, maybe you don't get, I don't know, two terabytes is plenty for me. I, I rarely use more than one terabyte, but I like having that. I Since I do use one terabyte, I don't want to run out of room, so I like having a exactly. little extra. Yeah. Yeah, Great advice as always, Leo. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and by the way, if you do get a PC, uh, be careful not to get one of the proprietary SSD because then you're going to pay an arm and a leg. Get one that uses standard ones. Are you going to do desktop or laptop? This would be for a desktop. Yeah. Um, I have an Alienware. That's from Dell, but I'm very happy with that. That uses standard uh, M.2 SSDs. Um and by the way, that's another thing you can do. And I do do this on my um, Alienware. I have a, a SSD for the boot drive, but the data drive is spinning drive. So you can have more capacity, lower cost. Oh, Although I think if you price it out, it's not that much different. I think the, that is even, that was four years. That was at the beginning of COVID. So I think that probably now I would get all SSD. Thinking who else? All right, well, look at look at uh, Falcon uh, Northwest. Look at some of the gaming uh, rigs. What do you guys like in the chat room? IRC or Discord for gaming rigs these days. Uh, Burke says Dell, which is Alienware. They have There's another company I've been seeing pop up called Starforge. People have been talking about Starforge. that. Starforge. I don't know that one. Yeah, that one's just like within the last year or so. There are companies that make these gaming PCs. The nice thing is they, um, they're usually able, you can customize them more. I The one thing I don't agree with is they do all this case mod stuff, you know, with lights and stuff. That's silly. And it's just going to cause it, your wife to pay more attention. <laughs> don't don't attract attention. <laughs> beige box. Profile. Go with a beige box. The um, uh, reason I asked if you want a, a, a laptop or desktop is because I do like the frameworks. I've ordered the framework. These are laptops of so the 16-inch framework. Uh, it uses standard everything. And it's replaceable and upgradable. So when that comes, that'll come late this year, early next year. I will give you a demo. But it's probably not the best. It's... It's you want to get a, a real game machine. You're going to get a desktop. Um, Asus makes the Republic of Game Gamer uh, uh, machines. I have one of those. I bought one of those for my uh, son. He's had he's had good results with that Falcon Northwest Origin. Oh, Puget Systems. I often forget them. They're really I like those guys. They're really good. So there's some good ones. We'll put a link in the show notes. Marsworm in our IRC has a link to a Tom's hardware article and the relatively recent article on the best uh, gaming PCs, um, of 2023. These are pre-builds, but see all that, all that silly, you know, yeah. LEDs and all that stuff. I don't, I don't go for that, man. I can't go for that. No can do. Plus that's just going to get spousal. This is for, this is for <laughs> teenage boys. This is not, or, or, or older men who there's an alien where that's the one I have is the Aurora. Speaking as a older person. Yes. I, I do like this color. You like those? I have a simple, yeah. nothing fancy. Though. I got mine with an AMD in it, uh, a Ryzen. Cause, uh, I really think those give you a good bang for the buck. So if you want to save money, uh, an AMD is good, but you definitely want an Nvidia. Uh, video card. You don't have to get the top of the line 4090, but uh, you definitely Corsair makes nice stuff. I like Corsair. Oh, that Lenovo Legion. I've heard some people say good things about the Legions. That's Lenovo's gaming PC. So those are all in the list. Uh, I bought the Alienware Aurora uh, and I'm very happy with that thing. It's a, it sounds like a jet taking off. That's the only negative. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's great to talk to you. Thank you for uh, being Thank our first so call much, today. Leo. And it's nice to hear from you. you. Now that you know the way, come come back and call us again. All right, take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah, somebody's saying, and you're right, user 5819, the Alienware tends to use weirdly shaped proprietary stuff because they have such weird cases. Get a square beige case. Corsair would be a good one. They'd be very standard, you know. Um, phone number 888-724-2884. Very good. Thank you. You noticed I paused. I wasn't sure. Uh, should I go to Byron? Let's go to Byron. I'm, I'm having fun talking to people on Zoom today. Mike has the day off, a little under the weather. 
Uh, he went to the podcast movement, the big podcast expo, with my wife and Max, our sales guy, and Ryan. All but Ryan got sick. You know, I'm not going to any conferences. We are going, though. I should mention, we're going to Green Bay, and we're going to have a meetup in Green Bay. I'm hearing from more and more people in the Midwest who want to come. So that'll be September 29th. We haven't yet found a venue, but it'll be in Green Bay proper. We're going out because our son is a Packers fan. I don't know where we've gone wrong, but uh, we're going to go out and see a Packers game, which actually I'm really excited about. We're going to get the, the stadium tour at Lambeau and all that stuff. So September, put that in your, save the date, I guess is what, what the brides call it. September 29th uh, in, uh, in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. If you're out there, uh, we would love to see you. Uh, did Byron show up in the, oh, he, hey, he, he, you scared me. Hi, Byron. Hi, uh, this is Byron from uh, St. Augustine, Florida. I should know it by now. You've called before Byron. Hi, Byron. Actually, so long time listener, uh, first time caller. Oh, first time. Okay. Um, Must be another Byron. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Look at that beautiful uh, sunset you've got going. Or is that a sunrise? Uh, I had the sunset. I took it on a Baltimore Harbor cruise. Oh, nice. I love the Baltimore Harbor. That's a great place. Oh, it's beautiful. They have those little yeah. boats going. That's so much fun. Anyway, what can I do for you, Biren? Yeah, so um, I'll kind of give you a little bit of the background, and then I'll lead up to my question. So our primary um, TV is a projector. Yeah. And in 2005, when we kind of designed this house, I had a conduit put in. Um, we've gone through four projectors since. Oh my! Um, finally, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it it was 720p the first one in you know yeah 2000 whatever, and then finally got to um, uh, the latest one, which just got last year, which is the Epson LS 12,000. Kind of had to wait about eight months because of supply chain issues, and you know Best Buy finally went to them. They apparently have a direct contract with um or a buyer's contract with Epson. So anyway, within about a month, uh, the projector arrived. I had it installed. Now, so it's, you know, as you know, it's an upscale 4K projector, right? Uh, it's, it's not a native uh, 4K. Right, right. I, I've upgraded my Denon um, uh, receiver, um, you know, last or early last year. So everything's pretty much upgraded all the way up to 8K capable. The problem is when they were installing um, the the wire, the, the HDMI through the conduit, at that time, 25 feet was the longest they had. And uh, I need about 35 feet. Oh, um, <laughs> so, so, I get H so, so they install HDMI 2.0. Oh, um, no. And oh. Yeah. And I, I wasn't home and, you know, um, yeah. my wife was here. So you're not and, getting 4K. I'm not getting 4K. I've got Apple TV. I've got, you know, Blu-ray, um, everything else, all the other components, including direct TV. Everything's been upgraded. Um, you know, it's all 4K compatible, except my, my wire. So I so, did some research and I was, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah. So I, I did my research and, you know, read through Monoprice Price and some other sites that, cables longer than 25 feet for HDMI 2.1 you know would not produce the best or maybe you know there's some kind of a signal loss and so um, there's a company that I found called Fiber Command um, FiberCommand.com and they actually have fiber optic cables and then you can attach HDMI ends uh, you know for in let me let out. me tell you what I would recommend. Yeah. Uh, that's cheaper. Okay. You need a Balun or a Balun, B-A-L-U-N. Fortunately, because they, okay. they did pull the cable, you can attach something to it, pull it out and pull the new one in behind it as you, as you pull it out. Uh, cause yeah, 2.0 is a bad idea. You can go, uh, a lot longer. You can go as long as you want using cat five or cat six with a HDMI Balun. So what this does is it connects the HDMI on one end, converts it into a signal that can go over Ethernet, and then on the other end, converts it back. And 
that way you can get 4K, 8K, you can get as much as you want uh, over as much as 150 feet. I've gone, I've gone about 80 feet with mine uh, and it works fine. So you want to look for one that supports 4K. You'll probably, so what you'll do is you'll take that HDMI 2.0 cable, attach an Ethernet, a good Cat6 or better Ethernet to it. It's not that long, so you can get it. It won't be that expensive. And pull it through so you've got the Ethernet at both ends. And now you put the Balins on the Ethernet, and that gives you an HDMI output on either side. And the HDMI goes right through it. It works great. Uh, I've had great results doing that. That's probably the simplest way to do it. I think fiber, how much is the fiber optic solution? So here's the, here's the thing. I actually already bought it. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and <laughs> Never mind. Forget I mentioned well, anything. No, 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 no. I, I, I can always return it. Um, it's like $350 for a 50 foot. Um, and I read the reviews. That's not bad. That's not website. bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think I was going to expect that kind of a cost. Um, and the reviews on their website are, are all good. You know, they're all. It's doing the same thing a Balin does, except instead of converting it to Ethernet, it's converting it to fiber. Because uh, you have HDMI on both ends, right? You have a little box and then you have fiber optic cable going through. Yeah, that's that's, that's probably it. just as good. In fact, probably better because it's going to be in the long run more capable. That fiber can carry a lot of data. What's the, but clearly you have a problem. <laughs> yeah. And and the mismatch of signals, you know, you oh. change from one thing to the next. It takes like five to ten seconds or whatever. Oh, longer. yeah, yeah, yeah. For the handshake. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. I'm shaking yeah. my hand. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the TV has to go, well, what can you do? Uh, projector. And then, uh, or not the TV, the, the streamers, what can you do projector? And they go back and forth till they agree on a, uh, uh, resolution frame rate, not just that protocol. Uh, and then they, once they've agreed, they can, they can do it. Five seconds seems kind of long. It's not unusual though, to see, a little while it's doing it. Remember the old days on the modems, they would go, yeah, they were handshaking. They were trying to figure out, what can you say? I can do this. Can you do that? And figuring it out. Um, right. I don't know if there's any way to, sh to shorten that. That's just, that's just how HDMI works. I'm surprised. It's yeah, no, I, I, And, and and what I did is I did a pass through through the receiver so that it doesn't do any processing, you know, and I play around with the settings, with the dead on. Um it it still kind of it's not like perfect, you know. Um huh. what I did do is buy fiber from for the uh direct TV. Um so all the components have their short, you know, three meter uh, fiber cables. Right. And that's working just fine. It's just, of course, the main one is, you know, it's HDMI 2.0. So. So oh, you haven't put in this new fiber solution yet? Not yet. Okay. I'm waiting for an install to kind of happen. Yeah, I think, I think this. So what, where's the handshake problem now? Is it with the 2.0? I've isolated to the 2.0. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Just, what I, I did this is will I, all be better when you have more bandwidth. Don't, I think this will go away. Okay. Probably yeah, it's absolutely. because the TV really wants to send UHD and, 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 uh, or this, the Denon wants to send UHD and the cable is just like, what do you, what, what's this, what's this cable? This thing's terrible. It's fighting it. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be better once you get the uh, new system in. Good for you. That's okay, a good solution. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think you did a good thing. Now, when you get ready to, I'm really sad because don't tell anybody. Don't tell Lisa this. We had that high sense, hundred inch, beautiful projector. It was a short throw, which I like. Unlike yours, which you have to position just right and and all that across the room. Well, Mars was right now underneath it, which I really liked. Um, it looked like this. Well, except our living room doesn't look like this. But the short throw projectors are nice because they, they sit right under where you're kind of, it's like a regular TV set. 
And I, I loved it, but I didn't like the projectors a little washed out compared to uh, direct view. As you know, you have to darken the room and stuff. And I thought, I yeah. like having a 120-inch screen, but I am going to get this QD OLED. It's a really good deal right now from Samsung. It's QD. It's the best OLEDs out there. 77 inches. That should be plenty. Sigh. <laughs> I really miss the giant screen, especially for football. I really miss having that big screen. I gave it to Micah. So if I ever want to, you know, have fun, I'll go over to Micah's. Did you get the short throw or did you get the long, the normal Epson? Uh, the normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Seating mounted. Yeah. yeah. And it's about 12 feet That's away from fine. The if you don't mind, sounds like you got a pretty nice home theater. If you don't mind mounting it on the ceiling and all that, that's fine. That's why you have such yeah. a long. Now I understand why your cable is so long. It's up in the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah, one way to solve the this. Conduit. Yeah, I get it. And it's good. Once you have the conduit, that's great. Short throw really solves that because the TV is right there. It's where everything else is. Uh, so you don't have long uh, cables or anything like that. You Enjoy your lovely project. How big is the screen? Uh, it's 92 inches. Isn't that nice? Which is big enough for I, us. I, so. I miss having that big screen. It was so much fun. We'd have parties. People come over. We have, you know, 20 people watching the Super Bowl. and It was so much fun to have that giant screen. Now I'm going to be embarrassed when people come over to see that 77-inch. I'm just going to be humiliated. I'm sorry. We have such a small screen. <laughs> hey, it's a pleasure talking to you, Byron. Thank you. I'm glad you uh, found a uh, beer I'm sorry. I'm glad you found the, uh, the place and come back again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Leo, Enjoy your new setup. You Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Sounds Thank pretty you. nice. It sounds really great. Yeah, the mo modern Balins uh, do support, uh, you know, UHD. But um, I think fiber probably is better. More bandwidth is better, right? Always nice. Let's take a little time out. Coming up in about uh, 10 minutes, a visit from Dickie D. We'll do more calls before that, though. But I do want to mention uh, our sponsor, our show today, brought to you by literally Cashfly. When I say literally, I mean... <laughs> Cashfly is our CDN, our content delivery network. So when you go to the website and watch a show or listen, when you use your podcast client to download and listen to a show, you're getting it directly from Cashfly. Why do we do that? Because we're not crazy. We tried <laughs> in the early days of Twit. You might remember if you've been around 20 years or 18 anyway, in the early days, we, we just had it on the website. You download it for the website. Constant problems because so many people were downloading it at the same time that's one of the problems they're all downloading at the same time right you know if they had spread it out throughout the week it wouldn't be so bad so then we went to BitTorrent, tried that that was awful i had to ask beg people could you please seed our our client our content because we can't get it to our audience that's when matt levine the great matt levine founder of cashfly came and said i can help and they have ever since they have been our cdn they are innovators. They are celebrating their 20th anniversary of TCP Anycast. They've been doing this since 2002, it's 20th anniversary. Since 1999, Cashfly has had the track record for high-performing, ultra-reliable content delivery. They started using TCP Anycast. They were, I think, the first in 2002. It's an innovation CDNs continue to build on this day. With more than 3,500 clients, including Twit, in over 80 countries, Organizations choose Cashfly for several reasons. Scalability, reliability, and unrivaled performance. We get all three. And I should mention the best service ever. Their support is so good. Cashfly's smart image optimization is great for websites. Yeah, they do websites for gaming, for streaming, for podcasts, for content of any kind, including websites. Try the smart image optimization. It's a fast, secure image processing service that actually automatically will transform and optimize images on the fly. So your website's got images on there. You know you can't use those big, large, uncompressed images. It slows it down. Users will hate it. You get bad search rankings. But at the same time, you want to have images on your site that look great, of course, and you, you want them to look great on every size screen. From Buren's, you know, 92-inch screen down to somebody's, you know, 6-inch smartphone. Smart image optimization does it. Cashfly gives you everything you could ever want. Ultra low latency video streaming to more than a million concurrent users. Lightning fast gaming. Downloads are faster. Zero lag glitches, outages. 
that mobile content optimization I was talking about. They're the only CDN built for throughput, delivering rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, 30% faster than other major CDNs. And we love the billing because it's flexible. Because this is the problem for most content is spiky, right? There's a big bunch of downloads all at once and then nothing for a while. And then a big bunch of that. How do you do that in billing? Well, Cashfly will work with you. They'll give you month-to-month -month billing as long as you need it. Discounts for fixed terms once you're happy. You really design your own contract. That's what we did when you switched to Cashfly. Join Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN for a limited time. Cashfly is offering a free 5 terabyte tier plan. I would check that one out. Cashfly.com. Get you, you can also get your first month free on other plans. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Cashfly. Free. This is new. The five terabyte free tier. That's an awful lot. Now, I have to say, we send, I think, three petabytes a month through Cashfly. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> uh, so we couldn't use the five terabyte tier, but uh, you you might be able to. Thank you, Cashfly. C A C A G F L Y dot com. Uh, let's see. Johnny, should I do a, I got so many calls let's do, here. let's do a phone call. All right. Um, I'll do the wireless caller. See who that is. We just, all we know is you're wireless. But press star six to unmute and say, <laughs> hello. Hello. Hey, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hey, Leo, this is uh, Kenny from Cottontown, Tennessee. Hey, it's Kenny Canada. from Cottontown. Hi, Kenny. Hey, I just want to let you know that, um, kind of give you a little bit of update. I still don't have a IT job yet, but I have been kind of learning with the job that I'm at right now as far as some of the processes go where I have been allowed to communicate with some people in the field and I have a kind of an understanding of it, but the way things have been going right now with my job, I'm kind of comfortable where I'm at. And, you know, hopefully down the road, I might take advantage of some of it. But I have been learning a little bit of it just from the communications of it and watching, you know, like when you do remote connections. So, you know, I try to pay attention as much as I can. But um, that's the best way I to learn. Go back to course. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's on the job training. Ken, we should, for people who don't know, we've been following Kenny's progress now for how many years? A couple of years you wanted to retrain, go back to school, yes. become an IT professional. And we've been just kind of keeping up. And I'm glad to always uh, always hear about this. That's great. That's great. The, this is the hard thing, again, that real IT job is you have to have some practice, some skills. They don't want you to be this there to be your first job. But so I think this is a good way to do it. I think that's great. Yeah, and along the way, I actually did go back to Coursera and took a couple of Python classes. Good. So that way I could get it's good to know uh, Python. figured out yeah. on that. Very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Python is used to uh, automate things, to script things. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, IT professionals will use PowerShell, Bash scripting, you know, command line scripting. But when, you, when it gets a little bit more serious, it's really nice to have a, a real coding language under your belt. And Python is a very good one. That's so versatile. Knowing that will be extremely useful. So good job. I think that's good. You did that at Coursera, huh? Yeah. And it wasn't with Google this time. It was actually um, with the University of Michigan. They nice. have a professor. And I don't know if you know his name, uh, Dr. Charles uh, Severance. He had a couple of programs he was involved in, Python nice. for everybody, and I think it was Python 3 related because the first class I took with him, it was mostly with Python 2.7. Yeah, you want, you want to know 3, although it doesn't, doesn't hurt to know 2.7, yeah. but you really need 3 now. 3.1.1 is the current version of yeah. Python. Yeah. In fact, Microsoft just announced that you can use Python uh, with Excel spreadsheets, which is really cool. Yeah, that's what I was calling about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's really cool that they're doing that. And that kind of ties in because a lot of what I've been learning is that. So it's going to help out in that field for sure for where I'm kind of doing clerk related material. Yeah. You know, all of these skills are valuable. You know, I when I, you, I look at our IT guy, he's an MSP, Russell. Great. He's not he's not our employee. We've tried to hire him a million times. He said, no, I like having my own business. Uh, but he comes here every Wednesday he's in, really helps us. And he knows so many things about so many things that he's really useful. You know, he can code, he can, 
He can, you know, he knows about video transmission. He knows everything. So the more, you know, the, the bigger your bag of skills, the better off you're going to be. So nothing you're learning at this point is not going to be of use in an IT career. I think it all really helps. So I'm glad you're doing well. That's true. Yeah. Now it's weird the way they're doing Python and Excel. You actually, it doesn't run the Python in Excel. It uploads, it uploads it and downloads the result. It's running in the cloud, which of course yeah. that's Microsoft's business uh, is in the cloud. But that way they didn't have to modify Excel so much. They didn't have to put a Python interpreter into Excel, just the ability to mm -hmm. send the code up, get it run and get the result back. Still, from your point of view, the user's point of view, it doesn't matter how it's doing it. You, you do have to have an internet connection, but everybody does nowadays. And it's really nice to have that capability. Good, learn Python. That's fantastic. Plus, I have to say, knowing how to code, even if you're not a coder, is really valuable in understanding better how, what's going on inside the machine. Once you understand the logic of the machine and the logic mm -hmm. of, of programs, that makes you much better at diagnosing issues that you're going to come up against because you kind of understand how the bits are flowing it really helps so uh, keep up the good mm -hmm. work i think you're doing a great job kenny i'm really proud of you you've 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 come a long oh, way you. haven't you yes i have and i am getting my coding work right now because parallels just announced that they have with their upgrade to uh, parallels desktop 19 they're adding uh binaries x86 slash 64 in the Linux. There's a emulation oh. for Ubuntu Linux on that. Nice. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn a little bit of how to navigate certain things. Like when you're trying to install programs, like I was trying to install a Dropbox that they don't have an ARM 64. No, you, yeah, 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 yeah. And you're doing that in the command line. So this is where I, this is where I admire you. First of all, perseverance you, you, you know, you're determined. You really want to do it. You're working hard, which is really great. And you're open to new skills. And your attitude is really good. I think the, you know, everything's going great, Kenny. I'm really proud of you. Well done. Keep up the good work, okay? All right. It's good to talk All to right. you. All right. Well, I appreciate it. It's good to talk to you. And I hope you have a good rest of the show. And so Mike, I said hi and get well soon. Yeah, I hope so too. He's feeling all right, actually. So is Lisa. Um Congratulations to our friend Marquez Brownlee. Did you see this? Champion, ultimate Frisbee guy. That is one hell of a big trophy. I don't know what he won, but <laughs> he is, uh, he, if you've ever seen him, there's his team. If you've ever seen him uh, uh, play ultimate Frisbee, he is amazing. He is really, really good. And uh, his team won, uh, feels like the world championship, the size of that cup. I don't, I don't know what, what it was. Uh, does anybody know? Uh, was it the New Jersey State champion, the U.S. champions? Figure the size of that. Hey, Siri, play Empire State of the... Oh, Empire Ultimate is the name of his... Uh, the New York Empire is the name of his ultimate Frisbee. And uh, they are the 2022 Autel Champions East Division. Okay. That is a heck of a big cup. For New York Empire Ultimate Frisbee team. Is Dickie D ready or should I do another call? Oh, I'm set. You're set? You're ready. You know what? I feel like you're always here. Like you never really I never, leave. No, I never leave. Yeah. I, I shut, I, I go just to do Giz, uh, Giz Wiz and then I sit back for you. <laughs> here is, uh, here is uh, I think, a shot of the game winning uh, moment in the. Uh, Empire State's uh, Ultimate Frisbee Championship. If you uh, show that on the screen, you can. <laughs> Dickie D. Dick D. Bartolo, <laughs> Mad Magazine's maddest writer, a member of the usual gang of idiots for more than five decades. And I am proud to say our gizmo wizard. We call him the Giz Wiz. He's coming to us from beautiful downtown Disneyland. Hello, Dickie. Leo, how you doing, pal? You know, I've been reading the most amazing book. And when I say I've been reading, I mean it. It's uh, it's uh, 1,300 pages. Oh, uh, gosh. Considered to be one of the greatest biographies of all time. Uh, Robert Caro's uh, biography of Robert Moses, the man who really oh. built New York City. 
And one of the things he built is Riverside Drive, that yacht harbor where you parked your boats for so many a years. Absolutely. And the park where I played in as a two-year-old. And to read about this, you know, it used to be in the 30s. That was railroad yards. It was ugly. It was slag heaps. It was smoke from the trains. And he uh, would go by on a boat and look at it and dreamed of building this beautiful Riverside Park and Riverside Drive. And he did. And uh, that's the good side of Robert Moses. There's some bad sides as well, because he tore yes, down a lot of yes. communities in order to do that. Uh, but he really is the architect of uh, New York City. Uh, and it's a you fascinating know, when I, biography. Yeah. When I moved here, like 45 years ago, the lady upstairs was an older woman. And she said that she lived here when the railroads wow. still ran steam trains. Wow. And you could not get to the river. Every 10 blocks, there was a bridge right. across the railroad tracks. Right. Sounded so like it was it, pretty ugly. Yeah. 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 Although yeah. steam trains. <laughs> well, I, I know. Like you know, I have mixed part. feelings about this because one of the things Moses did. did is he basically highway <laughs> highway fied New York City. He used to have to drive yes. over city streets to get, you know, to Long Island or to get to the Bronx. And uh, and then he built the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Triborough and all that. But uh, it also really promoted car traffic and and kind of demoted <laughs> mass transit to some degree. Uh, so I have mixed feelings about that too. I yeah. do love the trains. The, I do the same. The yeah. same with me. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, anyway, good biography. I I highly recommend it if you've got about uh, sixty hours of oh free time gosh. lying around. It's taken me a long time. I'll bring the book in. I bought the book because I I've been listening to it. And I thought I should have the book because it's got pictures of. It's literally you. It's it's a great doorstop though. In case you ever need one, <laughs> Dick. This is no door. Yes. This will not work as a doorstop. This is the new Mad Magazine. Can I show this? Absolutely. Sometimes yes, it, yes, you it say it's out. it's embargoed. It's not embargoed. No, no, it's not embargoed. Yeah. It's the October issue, but it's out now. It says "Mad" goes back to "Ghoul," <laughs> and uh, there's Wednesday Adams, and uh, Thing is picking her nose. And what I really liked about this is it's all the different iterations of the Adams family, going back to Charles Adams' famous New Yorker cartoons. Absolutely, yeah. and I, I actually wrote the, the satire on the movie version, the oh. ad nauseum family. <laughs> of course, you did. <laughs> I love your, I love your uh, movie parodies. They're so great. Who illustrated the uh, oh, Mort Drucker? Mort Drucker. Oh, my, one of my favorites. Yeah, I love Mort Drucker. He's so good. Oh, this is great. The ad nauseum family. The crazy yeah, and the cookie. Yeah, and then I did. Um, gosh, oh, I did fun. another thing there that that Tom Fileman, uh, Tom Fileman, Tom Tom Richmond illustrated. Oh, uh, the uh, uh, Van Helsing, the movie Van Helsing. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're the king of movie parodies, aren't you? How do you get the ideas for that? Do you just sit there? Does it start with a name? Uh, the worst is when. The movie has a single name like Airport. Yeah, not much you, you know? could do with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same with Val Helsink, but at least uh Val Helsing it was. Uh yeah, that that's, Helsink okay. is good. Yeah. That's a every good once in a while you'll get a long title that like a TV show, Voyage to Sea uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Oh, that gives you lots of room. Yeah. Voyage to see what's on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, does it start it, it, for you does the parody start with the name no sometimes if i can't think of a name i just jump into the panels right and then uh along the way sometimes i just walk through the park and think what what can i possibly do with this see we could thank robert yeah. moses for van helsing yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Without Robert Moses, there would be no movie parodies. That's yeah. fun. Go for a walk. Gets the brain working. Gets the juices. Yes, working. absolutely. Yeah. And Tom Richmond did the art uh, on that. Yeah, this one's He's color, which is kind of nice. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Really Most good. of Mad in my lifetime was black and white. When did it start doing color stuff? You know, it started. Uh, one it was always after Mad to do ads, and yeah. He, uh, and Man, Mad never had ads in my time, in my day. No, it only had no. ads like this. Look, Mom, no more <laughs> cavities. Yeah, because his teeth were knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so, but then when they said, you know, Mad did one Mad in color and it sold really well. And then Warner said, you know, if you take like four ads, the ad companies have to pay for the oh, color press. Oh. And that way you can get as much color as you want, kind of as a free ride. So that's when Mad started taking ads, but adding a lot of color. I do like in this Van Helsink, the marginalia. Is it Sergio Aragones who did Sergio? The, yes. Oh gosh, I love his his little drawings in the in the margins there. It's the, yeah. so great. <laughs> when I was a kid, I mean, I grew up with this, and I just, I just, I devoured every issue. I remember I would go bring my thirty five cents to the uh, Liggett's Drug Store, and I'd give them. Sometimes in pennies, the 35 cents and <laughs> come home with the new Mad Magazine. Well, we're going to tell you how you could win this without a penny in just a little bit. Yeah. But first, let's get a gid gidget or a gadget or a gizmo. Okay, well, a couple of months ago when I was on the show, I showed you a bubble maker that was great fun. <laughs> that Micah bought immediately, yes. Yes, well, Micah, he better get his credit. If he's watching, I'm sure he is. The double bubble blaster. <laughs> so now, let me see if I, I, I'm going to put this on very low because I don't want them. Oh, my God. <laughs> Stop blasting me with bubbles, Dick. Holy moly. That's fun. Yeah. <clears throat> this is two motors, two spinning bubble wands. <laughs> this and is, Leo, the, this is so over the top. It's just not only that, it's Leo, it takes the whole bottle a bubble uh, soap right inside. You open the back. And how and long does dip. that last? You know what? I haven't run through it yet. Oh, good. But yeah. Because bubbles um, are thin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you close the back and then it comes with a rechargeable battery <sighs> and uh, a little rechargeable a plug for the oh there you go there there's you your go. video there's of doing it in your backyard yeah. so th yeah there's the little battery that goes <clears throat> into the handle of the bubble blaster and there's a little cable for charging it and they call it the engineering bubble car because <laughs> i think from the side it's supposed to look like a truck oh yeah it's it looks like of, a bulldozer it, it, yeah, yeah it looks like a bulldozer yeah exactly yeah it's a bubble bulldozer it's, yeah, so you holy, take the whole bottle of, of, of This bubbles. has to be the ultimate in bubble tech. Oh, my gosh. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, my and, gosh. And, but wait, there's more. <laughs> yes, yes. It has LEDs. Oh. So that if, it's, if you're doing bubbles at night. I want to see that, in the, the dark. <gasps> the bu I don't, I have it. Oh. The bubbles themselves are colorful. Yeah. But at night. It can add the uh, some more color from the LEDs. I think this is really good. You're having so much fun in your backyard. And the neighbors are going, what the hell is going on? No, there, there were no neighbors. I got on a ladder and yeah, I was shooting stuff into yards thinking, is someone going to come out and say, what is that? Nobody. Not um, a, nobody. <laughs> yeah. They all ran for cover. Uh, wow. Yeah. The double yeah. bubble blaster. Who's blaster. this from? You know what? They just call it the bubble machine engineering car. And the, you know what? Look on your, oh, it's still there. Today, I went and looked and there's a 20% off coupon. Oh, wow. So it's down to- 30 bucks. What? 24 bucks, right? 24. Well, this is 29.99, but you're saying with, oh, apply the 20% coupon. Apply 20% oh, off. Oh, look at that. I don't even know why they bother. Yeah. So that'll bring it down to 24 bucks and it comes with four bottles of bubble goo. Oh my gosh. That's 40,000 right bubbles according to the manufacturer. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dennis is still in the yard counting them. So <laughs> two not one but two powerful built-in motors, two fans, 18 spinning ones, 10,000 bubbles a minute. Well, well I could not actually counting. check. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The, yeah. But it's great fun. I think kids, uh, the, the I, thing says six and up. But. I love this. All in, uh, every letter is capitalized. The built-in design of the bubble solution is the pinnacle work allowing children to play with the bubble machine while frolicking. There is no longer the distress <laughs> of adding bubble liquid after playing for two seconds. So this is f for frolicking, basically. Yes. Made yeah, for well, frolicking. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you should be six and above in order to frolic. I, I, we I think Lawrence out. Welk had this machine <laughs> in the back uh, with the uh, beautiful sisters. Uh, wow. Wow. This is for a wedding? You bring these oh, out, my. though, you, be careful because it looks dangerous. It's got, you know, heavy duty grips and stuff. Wow. That is hysterical. Well, yeah. It's great fun. All it's right. great fun. Perfect and for your trouble-free one... frolicking. Yes. Yeah. And a very inexpensive gadget that I thought is so clever, and it's called the Carry Around, and it's a little pocket-sized device to carry three or four cups of soda or coffee when you're the when one you're frolicking. that... Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, you can when, never when have too much say, soda pop when you're frolicking. Yes. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Just uh, a little guy that folds up for your pocket. Oh my God. And then you never it, know. I sometimes you get to the counter and you get the four cups and you're trying to hold four cups with yeah. your two hands and they don't give you a tray. Now you just I could see Kramer whipping this out of his pocket and being ready. To bring the entire gang. This will be uh, Kevin when he brings us uh, brings Starbucks. Kevin out. does that by hand, right? When he goes out to Starbucks, he's he's carrying them like this. We should get this for Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's get one for Kevin. Maybe he'll uh, okay. get us coffee. Yeah. Yes, but but when you flip the handle up, yeah. you'll see a little thing that says three with an arrow and four with an arrow. I don't know how it works. If you open it to the right, four rings come out. What? If you open it to the left... Three rings. It's yeah, a can miracle. You play my little video. <laughs> yes. Oh, you got a video too? All uh, right. A, a tiny little video. It says uh, here's Dick clicky, with the tiny little clicky, three yeah, ring. Okay. Versus four ring. All right, so that video. that's the little guy there. And now I'm going to open it to the left. You've been elected to go to Starbucks or whatever, and you, so you start unpull that click one, and they lock in the place. Two clicks. That's. Look at that. Three, and now I'm going It's amazing. To How do they do that? Wow. <laughs> it's a miracle. But, it's a little but, cup carrying yeah. miracle. <laughs> but if you do it in, in the other direction. How can you have four only, red solo <clears throat> cups just lying around? <laughs> well, I was going to go to Starbucks and get four specialty coffees, but they want to No, this is a lot dollars. less expensive. No, right. Definitely. All right. So now all... Uh, Helen said, no, I don't want coffee today. Oh, it's just coffee for three. <laughs> now they're, they are balanced. Well, for three. now how much would you pay? <laughs> wow. It's 10 bucks. 10 bucks <laughs> for the, for the person who has to go get coffee. Dick D. Bartolo, Mads, maddest writer. And uh, I don't see this oh, is oh, uh, this is uh, so wimpy compared to the new one. Oh, what is? And uh, somebody put the safety that, on. I for, can't. That's for a that's for a child. This is for a child. You can't frolic only... <laughs> with a single motor and one outlet. That's no frolicking. You, all you can do is you can fa in that. You can but fra. no frolic. Yeah, no. Fr you, that's fra. Oh, that's yeah. a fra gun. It, you, you left the the hole open here. It's all drained out of my <laughs> of my thigh. Now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dick, by the way, happy yes. anniversary to you and Dennis. Thank you. Thank now, you. Now, you've been together a lot longer than 11 years. Uh, for, since 1980. Holy so 43. Cow, 43 years. But the state didn't allow you to recognize your, your true love until 11 years ago. And yeah, 11 uh, congr years ago. congratulations on Thank the 11th you so anniversary. Much. What is the 11th Thank anniversary so and is there frolicking involved? I think it's bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> congratulations. That's a wonderful anniversary. Thank you. That's, I'm very, that's very kind. I'm very, very happy kind for you and Dennis. Dennis is a wonderful guy. And, and, and by the way, Dennis brings snacks. And that's, you gotta, you gotta love somebody who brings snacks. Whenever you visit the kids, Absolutely. that's why Myra Absolutely. keeps showing up <laughs> every, uh, every Wednesday, right after this week in Google, it's the evening version of the Giz fizz with Dickie D right here on our live stream. And of course, club members can watch that anytime on demand on the Twit plus feed and, uh, and make sure Parker. you catch the weekly Giz whiz with Dick D Bartolo and Chad Johnson, uh, gizwiz.tv. Dick's, Website is gizwiz.biz. Now, I promised you I was going to get you a free copy of this fine Mad Magazine. 
how can we win a copy of Mad Magazine? Are, are we playing for the October Mad? Yes, you're, we're playing for that issue because it ends in like, uh, what, four days, I guess. Oh, it's Just at the end so, of August? Holy yes, moly. yeah. It's the uh, July-August What the Heck Is It game. Exactly. So go to my website, click on What the Heck Is It, and you'll see a gadget there and take a guess. Uh, I can tell you now, lots of people knew what it was. So really? if you want to- Be you clever. Can, be clever. Yes, yes, be clever. You have a better chance- it's tw it's six magazines for the right answer. We're going to do a, uh, a a poll here to pick out six, okay. but twelve for silly and clever answers. Judges' and you have decisions to be are end final. End of August thirty first. Yeah, just a few more days. Whatever it is, it clearly does a lot of things. It's like it's a bu little busy little box of something. I can't. That's very good. So yeah. accurate. That that's the kind of reporting <laughs> that. <laughs> That's the kind of tech report. That's why you're the tech guy. <laughs> hey, let me ask you, do you have any memories of Bob Barker passed away this week? At the yeah, age of you 99? know, uh, there was a, in 1980, Goodson had a, a summer show called That's My Line, not What's My Line, That's My Line. And it was about people with unusual, really unusual occupations. I mean, the most <laughs> terrorizing to me was the blind carpenter who built bookcases and I'm thinking, did they have bandages on all see him every store? No, no. <laughs> anyway, I was writing scripts and, and going to Goodson and Goodson said, Bob Barker won't say this. But, and I said, Mark, is it okay with you if I just call Bob Barker and ask <laughs> if I can go? Uh, he said, all right. So I called Bob Barker and I explained, I said, Bob, is it okay if we go over this stuff that he said, what are you kidding? I want to be funny. I want to look good. Yeah. Come on over to the house. And we worked together for 13 weeks. He was great. Wow. And a huge animal lover. Oh well, yes. So, Just yeah. like you. And, and yeah. we know that he uh, ended every show with Spay and Neuter Your Pets for the last uh, few years. of He got uh, furs taken off the prices. Right. At one point he That's said, right. Goodson, he said, you know, I, I not, going to continue hosting the prices right if we continue giving furs away of course i don't believe in that wow and he got his way of course yes so it was uh, super one of the greats um well it's i'm that's a nice little story yeah yeah it seemed like you know, a i'm trying gentleman. to i'm trying to get a nice little story about you <laughs> but <laughs> keep working having trouble <laughs> keep working Okay. All right. And have a good frolic. Okay, you and Dennis have some frolicking okay, fun you with your bubble master 9,000. Okay. Dick Thank D. You, Bartolo, pal. Mads Mattis writer. Thank you, Dickie see D. See you in a month. Okay, buddy. Take see care. See you in a month. Actually, I see him every Wednesday, but we don't have a long conversation like this. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think we should do a call. We can take a break in a few minutes. I think there's a. Uh, should I do north of Detroit? Yeah, I was going to say we yeah. haven't had. Yeah, I know. Um, I know a small town boy born and raised in South Detroit. I don't know anybody north of Detroit, so maybe Aaron can give me a geography lesson. <laughs> Aaron, join us. Welcome. Who oh, am I on? You're on. Join us in the Stargate. North of Detroit. What is north of Detroit? Oh, right in between Flint and Detroit uh, community, Clarkston. Clarkston. Nice. Very nice. Well, welcome. It's a, an oi, I, The joke is there is no South Detroit. That's Canada. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we always like that song for that reason. What can I do for you, my friend? Uh, I just, uh, I, I've been using Linux for a long time, but I've never become proficient in it. I mean, I, I love Linux, uh, but there's a few things that... Uh, I just, I can't seem to uh, connect with. Just to let you know, I've got a, a Myth TV box. Oh, yes. My, Very nice. Uh, I've got four Raspberry Pis that I use around the house. I have a uh, uh, a server that I'm trying to, to get going. But the one thing I really struggle with, and that is uh, just being able to connect from one computer to another to, mm. to manipulate it. Right. You're doing more for all your for all your apologies. You're doing more with Linux than most Linux users 
most Linux users, Linux is a free open source operating system that competes with Windows and Macintosh, runs on almost all PC hardware. Most uh, most of us are just, you know, playing with it. You're actually, you've got Myth TV, which is a, a Linux distribution that uh, does a DVR. It's a it's a media streamer. Uh, it's been around for a long time. And uh, and I'm, I was pleased to see that it's still around. So that's that's really good. Um, you're using it for uh, other things as well, but networking is a little bit tricksy. Um, we usually, when we network Linux machines, we use Linux's version of Microsoft Samba. It's called SMB. And you have to make sure that SMB is enabled. And it's further complicated because the older versions of SMB, stands for Server Message Block, uh, have been deprecated and are no longer in use. Linux open source version of this is called, and I think this is the, one of the best uh, names uh, in all of Linux, Samba. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so do you have Samba installed and enabled on all of your machines? You should be able to see them uh, on a machine and, and do file sharing. Uh, I agree this is one of the more advanced things people do with Linux. You want to transfer files from one Linux box to another mostly put stuff on your myth TV box or take it off. Uh, not necessarily, but just control it, you know, just uh, desktop ah. to desktop. Oh, you want to control it like, like VLC. Or, yeah. Yeah. VNC, I should say. Yeah. Okay. There's some very good uh, Linux tools. VNC is the, uh, is the thing you're looking for. And there are a variety of VNCs for Linux. If you look in your distro manager, Raspbian which on the Raspberry Pis is uh, basically Debian. Um, I don't know what Myth runs on. It's its own distribution. Uh, but all of them will have access to some sort of virtual network computing. Um, and then, so what generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll search for VNC in my package manager or my software, uh, add remove software program. And there'll be a number, they might be, there's one, my favorite name is chicken of the VNC, uh, but <laughs> there's tight VNC. Um, there's a variety of, of different open source VNCs, v, ultra VNC, real VNC, uh, tiger VNC. What these will do is you, you, it's a client server relationship. You'll put the server on the machine you want to access. You'll put the client on the machine you want to use to control the other machine. And, uh, and it, and then it's remote desktop basically. So that's the, that's the version of remote desktop that, uh, Linux most commonly uses. If you didn't want to have a whole desktop and you wanted to send commands, that's of course a lot more complicated. Um, I would say probably VNC is going to be the best way to go on this. What do, do you, I, I think you sounds like you want to maybe use one of the raspberry Pis to control your myth box, something like that. Uh, just well, just sitting here on, on the computer, I can actually, uh, I can see uh, my myth box and I, I'll try to connect to it and it just refuses. Uh, know, that's, that's where I run into problems. Yeah. So I've got, that's probably an authentication error. Yeah. Um, make sure on the myth box, and you may not, this may not be easy to do, but you, you, you want to log into the myth. Can you, can you log into the myth box and get a command line? Uh, not, uh, I've, so it seems like I've done it once and then all of a sudden I go to log back in again and it just fails and it, it, it refuses the connection. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not an expert on myth and myth TV and I'm not sure what remote access they build in. Typically if I'm going to, for instance, I have a Linux box here that is running my website and a variety of other things. And I have uh, computers at home, not just Linux, but Macs and Windows and, and Linux. And typically I'll use a, a protocol called SSH to log into this. And it gives me a command line on the computer here from any computer uh, anywhere else. Uh, SSH is good, strong, and, and powerful, but you do have to set it up. I'm not sure if Myth uses SSH. If it does, then you're going to need, and I'll tell you what it is conceptually. I can't tell you exactly the steps involved, but you're going to need to on the myth box, say this person is allowed to log in. Uh, you could do it by password. That's a little risky. I usually do it. This is why I didn't want to kind of get into this. It gets more complicated. I usually do it with a public key crypto. So I'll have a, 
a public key that I publish on the Mythbox and a private key that I keep on the computer I'm going to access it with. And when I open an SSH uh, session on the, on the remote box, it sees me and it, and it validates me without any password or anything, but it's very strong. Unless somebody has access to my private key, they can't get into it. That's the most secure way to do it. Because in effect, what you're doing is you're probably going to put this on the internet, in effect. You don't have to, but you, but I do. Certainly, I can SSH in from any computer. So you want to make sure that's absolutely secure. So the first thing I would do is look at Myth and SSH uh, and see if Myth supports SSH. If it does, you're going to want to make sure the SSH server is running and that you've given it permission to let these other computers, the Raspbian, the Raspberry Pi computers, get into it. Uh, it doesn't have to be, by the way. SSH works on Windows and Mac as well. So it's a it's very handy just to have your laptop and be able to SSH in. I probably could do it from here. Let me open a terminal. And that, and that's the, the problem. Sometimes I'll connect once and I go to do it again. I think, all right, I'm, I'm all set. Yeah. And it says, no, I, I don't know who you are. Forget it. Right. Right. So I'm going to SSH to uh, my computer across the room from my Macintosh. You can show this because it won't ask for a password or it shouldn't. Oh, it asked for my passphrase to validate the key. And now I'm in. So, oh, you're not looking at it. <laughs> so uh, when I do an LS now, that is not this computer. This is a Macintosh. This is the computer across the room because I've SSH'd into it. So I can run any program. In fact, I use a program called Tmux to keep these programs running. These are... Um, uh, these are uh, Minecraft servers, I think. I don't. Yeah, it looks like it's a Minecraft server. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, let's. I just exited out. Let me start my Minecraft server. So I'm starting a Minecraft server on a remote machine. If I do Control B N, I'll go to the next one and B N. This is the IRC running WeChat. These are all running in the background remotely on another machine. So I've logged in using SSH to these other machines. And I can see I'm running uh, four different Linux servers. I actually accidentally killed the survivor server. So if you were on our Minecraft server, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to kill it. I'm sorry, but I'm starting it up again. So that's, that's the best way if you want that kind of command line access from one machine. In this case, I'm calling from a Mac in the terminal to another machine. And then I'm going to control B and D, which will detach the Tmux server, but I'm still logged into the remote machine. It's called Beast. That's how I know. And uh, and then if I exit, I am now back to my connection is closed. I'm back to my Mac. So that's SSH. And the and the uh, thing. So the thing I can't tell you exactly how to do because I'm not familiar with Myth. But Myth is probably running an SSH server. It sounds like you've been able to get in at one point. Make sure that you have authenticated yourself with that SSH server. You're going to have to read up. On the you know do a man SSH to read all the commands for that, and you should be able to log into it from any machine. Again, if you're going to put it up in the, to the public, you're going to want to use uh, public key crypto, uh, you know, to make sure that that is really secure because you don't want bad guys to start logging into your myth box. Um, yeah. I I don't know if that's helpful or not. That's pretty high end stuff. Does that make sense? Everything uh, you talk about, I, I understand. I just, it's like, this, it was just that. Why uh, isn't it working? Like, yeah. 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 I'm not and sure. so it's, if there are a website that you like to go to that maybe, you know, to start you off from fresh, you know, just simple. Well, I'm on like right now. I'm on the Myth TV Wiki, which is a really good resource um, that describes installing. I think you may not have an SSH server running. If you don't, this describes how to set it up. It describes how to secure it. It's very important that you do that. Um, and then you can, oh, that's interesting. And then you can actually run the GUI through SSH, which is, SSH is kind of an amazing program. So I would start with the Myth TV Wiki uh, because that's going to have a lot of valuable uh, information in there and, and how to use SSH and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I use Myth TV just to record over the air. Is, well, is that? I'm sorry. I just assumed that was the box you want to log into. It yeah, is, that's that's just one of them. But I, I can't seem to do it. Raspberry Pi to Raspberry Pi either. either, huh? Yeah. 
So I, maybe I just haven't, you know, installed SSH, you know, like like I should have. What are you? So you are, you are you using SSH to try to log in, and then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yes. Yep. And so just uh, I'll just I'll just keep working on it, but I understand everything you're talking about. Yeah. But I think I'm, I'm missing a, a step here and there. So. Yeah, but this is how you'll, by the way, you know something about Linux, obviously, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> despite your, despite your uh, warning. Uh, I, I, this is how you learn, right? Uh, this yeah. is how I learn. I'm famous for saying, okay, this, uh, remember a few years ago, I, the audio wasn't working on our Linux box over here. And I said, well, let's go to the terminal. And we spent about half an hour in terminal commands getting the audio working. I, you know, I don't know how to do it until I do it. And then, and the good news is uh, there is, for Linux especially, the best resources, because Linux is basically by hobbyists and enthusiasts for hobbies and enthusiasts. And uh, and so there's a lot of material out there. You're not, you're probably running Debian or or Ubuntu or one of the Debian derivatives. You certainly are on your Raspberry Pi. But I always strongly recommend something called the Arch Wiki. Now this is, this is the most high end information out there, but it's also the most complete. Arch is a version of Linux, not Debian, not Ubuntu. Uh, that is uh, self-install. You're doing all the work yourself. So the Arch Linux wiki, wiki.archlinux.org, is inc an incredible resource of l basic, li all kinds of Linux information. Now, some of it doesn't apply to Ubuntu uh, and Deb other Debian derivatives, but a lot of it does. For instance, if I search for SSH, the SSH information will be very good here. Very good here. So there's a lot of information. Here's a different SSH servers, different ways to access it. Uh, there will be information in here, how to use public key crypto to secure your SSH, things like that. So you asked me for a site that I go to when I am puzzled in Linux, even if I'm not using Arch, I will often go to the Arch Wiki because everything is heavily documented uh, over, yeah. the, uh, uh, over there. Really a great resource. Yeah, I'm stuck on Ubuntu. I've tried others, but I always seem to go back to Ubuntu. Nothing, nothing wrong with Ubuntu. I, uh, it's a very good, like, very solid distro. Yeah, I like uh, Arch, Arch because well, I always like the newest thing. Whatever. That's why I new. use yeah, I use Manjaro, which is an Arch derivative. But I like these are called rolling distributions. So Ubuntu is a stable distribution. But you are like me. You always want to have the latest Firefox, the latest SSH, and all of that. Rolling distros update that stuff all the time. In fact, if if you're on a, in fact, I could do it right now. If I actually, I think my, um, I think my uh, my uh, the Beast Box over here is actually Debian, because it's a server and I want it to be more stable. So I I, I was going to go see if I have updates. I, I definitely do over here. I'm using Arch over here, and every time I do uh, Pacman, which is the Arch package manager. Uh, there will be 30 things that have to be updated. But that's what you want. If you want a rolling distro, you want to always keep up to date. Um, it sounds like you're doing pretty well. You know what you're doing. And I think just keep playing with it. The fact, it's a little puzzling that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. That sounds to me like firewall rules um, or something going on in your network. You might want to look at that Myth TV SSH port forwarding. That might help a lot for myth the myth tv box it might need something in your in your network your firewall that says yeah it's okay to ssh from this machine to that machine that kind of thing yeah because I, I just feel i can do a lot more just saying my yeah easy you know how you do it you don't get scared you don't freak out you you try it and it's nice to have those raspberry pi i wouldn't mess with your myth box but it's nice to have those raspberry pies it's nice to have a Linux box that you can mess with and know, hey, if I screw it up, I'll just reinstall. I'll reinstall. I can't tell you how many times I've reinstalled Linux on my Linux machines because I screwed them up somehow. That's how you learn. Yeah, I even have an open source uh, firmware on my router. Yeah, you know, nice. I love that. Easy. Oh, you know what you're doing. Uh, not easier than I thought. You're yeah. trying to hide your light under a bushel. You're a full geek. You're full on geek. <laughs> and I say that with love. <laughs> hey, it's a, right. well, it's a, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure meeting you. Call anytime. All right. Take care. Call.twit.tv for the Zoom, for the phone, 888 724 2884. This is Ask the Tech Guys. 
Micah Sargent has the week off, so it's just ask the tech guy. We should just tape that over. But uh, I did this show by myself for some time. I think I can fake it. Coming up in a half an hour, Sam Abul Samad, Mr. Car Guy. Lots of car news going on out there. Eric's been lounging. I'm going to make Eric sit up. <laughs> Eric, you look too comfortable. You don't have your hand raised, but I'm going to take a chance. Come on down. We're doing that in honor of Bob Barker this week. Actually, I say that all the time. How you doing? How you doing? Oh, you sat up. Now, come on. You look pretty comfortable in that chair over there. Yeah, uh, I'm just enjoying my uh, my uh, time off on uh, Sundays now. You, you you had me on my Ford, my truck on Sundays driving. Oh, you're our fa you're that Eric. Oh, I'm so yeah. so. You're at home with your 3D printer. Nice. <laughs> Tell me what you do with that sucker. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, RC hobby stuff, but, uh, yeah, I see your bench been, on the other side where your your soldering gun and all that stuff. That's yeah, nice. That, I, I just put that in yesterday. Oh, very nice. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I have Sundays off now and, uh, a Yay. week ago you couldn't walk, you couldn't walk in my room here. So I've been cleaning up Look my at that. hobby office. Isn't that nice? Have a nice place to go. A little man cave where you can hide out with your soldering gun and some men's magazines and watch some hunting and shooting and fishing. That's what I like. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> although with Lisa being ill with COVID, I ha I'm happy I have a man cave because I got a couch in there and I can hide out in there until she's feeling a little bit better. Um, there you go. What can, uh, so you didn't have your hand raised. You were just watching. We just pretend uh, we're driving this. somewhere. <laughs> just pretend. <laughs> do, 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 do. The universal drive. We were talking about this the other day. This either could be driving or milking a cow. If you want to make it like driving, you have to go like this. <laughs> do you ha do you have anything you want to talk about, Eric? Or are you just, just uh, not? No, uh, I do have something maybe in the future, but it's I, no I, I got to re no relearn problem. myself. It's a ham topic. I don't know if uh, okay. I'm a if, bad uh, ham, but I can maybe help you. I'll try. Uh, right up here. Here, I'll show you. What's that? What has he got there? That's the world's tiniest radio. Uh, this is a this is a Raspberry Pi four with a ham hat. <sighs> How fun! It. So it's a software. It's an SDF software defined radio. Yeah, and um, I it, I I built this though as a um, all in one, and it uses uh, PoE power over Ethernet. So you just plug oh, it into nice. Ethernet anywhere you. But are. it uses it uses a uh, it's an all-star mode. So uh, it's ham over VoIP or whatever, but you could just, with the, just a cheap uh, ham, ham handheld radio sitting here in the office, you could connect anybody around the world without. That um, is so cool. So, yeah, uh, so all-star is a network of uh, hams using Raspberry Pis, basically. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this basically works. I mean, I, I haven't used it in a while and I, I really don't know anybody that's built one like this. That's, uh, usually it's two boxes, but I built it very so cool. that it's uh, all in one unit. But, very nice. Um, and th I, that's really good. It's running asterisks, which is kind of cool, which is the old yeah. PBX system that allowed you to set up a PBX in your house. So you could have 20 lines <laughs> <laughs> in your home. This I, is really but, cool. And you, so you need a radio on, on one end. Because it is ultimately need, goes to radio. You're not using Echo Link. No, you need a handheld uh, ham radio. You just then you program a simplex, you know, radio frequency in it. You put it on low power. Wow. And then you could just talk anywhere throughout your building, office, whatever. But if you have two of these, and because the room that the room that I have, it, everybody has their own own individual room. Right. So in theory, I could have one, or you could have one. You could have one at your house. But then you you'd be able to walk around your your uh, location there and just use ham radio to communicate between two locations. That is sweet. Uh, and you can also talk to yeah. the moon if you want. <laughs> if you want yeah. to. Uh, That's really, really cool. So ultimately the back end is not radio, but the, but the uh, internet. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it is like echo link in that respect. That's, yeah. that's really cool. That's really cool. I remember, uh, 
going on a cruise and there was a guy sitting in the lobby with his hand held. And I said, are you, are you able to talk to people? He said, no, no, I'm echo link. I'm using echo link. It's connected to my phone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then to the internet. But this is what's cool about amateur radio these days. It's much more than just radio. It is all sorts of neat stuff. Right. Well, thank you, Eric, for sharing some of your home life with us. That's fantastic. No problem. Eventually, I like to make a second one and I'll send it to you. Then you can set it up and run it. Oh, no, no, no. You don't need to do that. But I, but I am very interested in it. That's very cool. Hams are amazing. I just love that community. Thank you, Eric. No problem. Have a great day. Sorry to bother Cheers. you on your day off. I didn't recognize him because he wasn't driving. No, because normally when we've seen him in the past, he's, 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 like, he's driving. He's yeah. going through places and stuff. That's really cool. I'm glad you got Sunday off. Kevin's been hanging on for a long time. He's in Las Vegas. Let's say hi to This has become a real geek fest without Micah today. This is me and my element, man. I love this stuff. Hey, Kevin, welcome to Ask the Tech Guys. Micah usually keeps me uh, down to earth. Hi, Leo. Hey, iWorld. You live in an iWorld? Oh, yeah. Back in the day from the uh, old uh, Macworld conventions that many that I uh, went to, but now RIP, of course. Yeah. Uh, but that's but a definitely uh, wanted to welcome you almost to uh, Vegas because I know you're going to be coming out in November. Formula One. Yeah. And thanks Is it for all crazy the now? Is the road, are the road systems completely messed up now? Road construction and highway, uh, what a mess. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm staying away from, definitely staying away from the uh, Strip. Whoever thought but, it uh, would be a good idea to turn the Las Vegas Strip into a Formula One track. <laughs> really, I don't know. I mean, I you know, it's great for Vegas. There'll be probably three or 400,000 people uh, over the race weekend. Uh, so it's, it's, and it's going to be cool for us to watch because it's 10 PM Saturday night. So it'll be a beautiful race. And I can't wait to yeah. see what they put on that MSG sphere yeah. because the track goes around the MSG sphere. So it is going to be a spectacular view to rival Singapore and some of the other beautiful races, but boy, I'd hate to be living in Vegas for the next couple of months. Oh, it's going to be really nuts. Well. <laughs> you don't need to see my command center here. So I'll give you a little. Oh, oh there there, that's right where we're going to be sitting, right, right in front of the, right in front right of the fountain. It's going to go right by there. In fact, I think they're going to be charging a lot more money for hotel rooms. Oh, I know they are. I already have one. We were we're staying at the Bellagio, and yeah. uh, it's several thousand a night. I can't remember, but it was a lot. I, you know what? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't really look. I just pressed the buy button and <laughs> kind of hid my eyes because it's very expensive. The tickets alone for the three days of the event are i think three thousand dollars are very expensive oh yeah it's nuts it's just crazy we're well, sitting in the grandstands in front of the fountains right on the strip which will be a yeah. nice high speed straightaway so basically we're going to sit there and see them go 69 times and it'll be over <laughs> well it's crazy because we've got uh new uh well they're always doing new construction on casinos but we've got a new one just about a couple of blocks from me the durango that's oh. opening up and then of course we've got the um super bowl coming in february unbelievable coming so my old haunt of the bay area are going to be out here uh, uh well in probably visiting in an, another uh ballpark until they build the new one which is going to be right where the tropicana is right now oh wow they're going to so we've got a lot of sporting events coming of course the aces the female uh, basketball team. Which you got is, the Golden you know, Knights. You got the Raiders. Right. You've got this has become. A, I mean, Vegas is always fun to go to, just for the. Sh I don't even gamble, right. just for the shows and the and the and the restaurants, and the hotels. But now there'll be so much to do. It really makes Las oh, Vegas a, a, a destination. I mean, ultimately, I think that's good. Yeah, I retired here just in time from the Bay Area about two, we, two years ago. We we have been thinking about. Uh, retiring to Vegas just because we just it's like a, we want to be able to go downstairs and party. <laughs> uh, it looks like so much fun. Oh, it is when you know uh, the shows and stuff. I mean, I do a little bit of gambling, but mostly it's the shows and going out to dinner. And yeah, if I were kind of if I had a problem, a gambling problem, or Lisa did, we would not even consider it because it's too expensive. But uh, Lisa, this is funny. She'll. 
she'll basically say, I, I can't remember what it is. Like I have a, I have $200 and, and it, once it's gone, it's gone. Unfortunately, <laughs> the last two times she once went in Reno and once in Vegas, she played the slots. She won 800 bucks one time and 600 bucks another time. So I'm afraid now I'm a little worried that she might say yeah. I'm a winner because no one's a winner in the long run. They don't build. Well, they didn't build this hotel on a bunch of people winning money from MGM. <laughs> well, the thing you have to do is say, "I'm going to take money to spend on gambling." Not to that's lose. what. That's exactly what she says. Yeah, this is yeah. what I'm going to spend. This is my entertainment budget. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to kind of reminisce a little bit. You know, about a week and a half ago, when you had the Mac Break Weekly uh, on the 25th anniversary of the iMac. Yeah. I. Uh, I never had an iMac, but I did have previous uh, compute. My first computer actually was a Power Mac 7600. So wow. I know about making the transition from older technology to USB, where the serial ports and ADB ports and the SCSI and, and all of that, and having to try to make that uh, last a little while by uh, using good old iOmega zip drives, which yep. until the Death always, you know, was a standby to get some more storage. I had something called an orb drive. I was doing everything. Oh, I had an that. orb. Did I remember those? The, yep. how, how big were they? Seemed like they were huge at the time, but I think in hindsight, they probably maybe it was 100 megabytes. How big were the orbs? I think it was like 500 megabytes. They were big. Or, yeah. Might have been, they, they were, they were might like, have they were Bernoulli it. boxes, I think. They had. Yeah. And yeah. those didn't. Didn't last either. No. So, I mean, I, kept, I mean, I tend to do that. We've talked about this before because I just recently got uh, last year a Mac uh, Studio Max to replace my cheese grater 2008 tower. And I kept that for 14 years. And I had the that power Mac for <laughs> probably about six years. And I had it after I went to the graphite G4 for like seven. I'm going to start years. calling you vintage Kevin. <laughs> that, I tell you, I keep those machines going. Well, I, on the Power Mac, I actually replaced the 604 processor with a G3 wow. Power Mac wow. company. And I added whatever. I think it was like 512 megs or something. Ooh, that's of, a, that was a of, lot in those of, days. That was like. Of memory. And I think, uh, I think it may be a 500 meg. I forget how much storage I got, but I, I it was just crazy trying to keep it going. Uh, so I tend to keep things going as long as possible, the technology, because it, it works. I mean, Macs do fine over the years. But now, my actually, to lead into my question about, uh, speaking of older technology, I'm using right now that um, my 10, my phone, iPhone 10, as it, on continuity on my Mac, uh, which is doing great. And I was surprised that it was still supported, and I'm still getting such a good picture, as you can Hopefully, see. Oh, is that what you're using right now? Wow, that's good. Yeah, yeah. that's the it's the it's my well, iPhone on, on continuity. Yeah. So yeah, it's been great. And whenever I've done any Zoom calling, uh, I've used it, and I want to continue to use it. And I was thinking, well, now we've got a good reason to kind of dedicate it to that because we've got iPhone 15 coming up. Yeah. And it's been over five years now. Yeah. So Maybe you get get yourself a 15, put the 10 on a tripod, and leave it there. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Either um, one of those uh, rigs they have on your monitor or just you get Eric to tripod. 3D print you a little thing to hold up. Yeah. The only reason I don't I like the ones on the monitor is because it's looking down on you. And uh, and for Zoom, the, ideally, you'd be looking at the person you're talking to. So what I do is I set up a little tripod and I actually put a small uh, uh, OBS cam, which is only about a three quarters of an inch cube on that it doesn't block much of the screen but i am now looking straight ahead at the person on the call and i think that that well that's what it, i have right now i have yeah you iPad. look this looks pretty good this is at eye level it looks really good yeah, yeah i'm using an ipad a stand that i use for my ipad pro but i'm using it right now on with the uh, camera right. and i think it like i think it works better that way so i was looking at probably getting one of those stands for it. The only question I have is I know we got besides all the hardware coming up, we've got iOS this and uh Sonoma 17 and is coming, Mac OS Sonoma. Uh all of this is imminent. I just got the uh I think the probably the last public beta of iOS 17 on my iPhone. I think they're very close to the release 
Because as you know, it'll be the yeah. 12th. They'll announce September 12th. They'll announce the new iPhones. That's what we think. And by the 22nd, you'll be getting new iPhones, which means they have to have iOS 17 pushed out probably on the 20th thereabouts so that everybody will get that up. So now the only question is, is that either Sonoma or iOS 17 going to brick my 10 in any way, or am I going to still have support? Uh, I know I won't be all the features because I don't have the, not, uh, the, the little notch thing. What the uh, Apple yeah. supported uh, device list is for iOS 17. Cause yeah, it's the 10 is, you know, at some point they're going to stop. They're going to stop supporting yeah, it. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if the 10 is, you know, they were supporting the last update was the 6S, as I remember. So maybe the 10 will be supported for a while. That's a, that's fairly modern. Um, yeah, I mean, I was surprised that I could still use it as continuity oh, camera. Oh, like, Scooter uh -oh. X says it's going to be the iPhone 11 and later. Uh, oh, oh, no. No. Ah! So oh, you're just no, gonna, gonna it's get... just gonna fall off the edge. Oh, well, I'm but that's just get... well, you're gonna get what you're getting now. You're already using continuity camera with it, right? Yeah. yeah so it just, just means it's... you won't get the newest stuff, but you but 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 it doesn't mean it'll stop working. It just you won't get oh. iOS 17. Oh yeah, because that's really the only thing I would use it yeah, for. Yeah, I think you'll be fine. I, I wasn't I wasn't so, planning to really repurpose it for if, anything else. If for some reason that stops working. There are very good third-party solutions that will let you continue to use it that basically do what Continuity Cam does even, even better. There's Ecamm, which is probably a little more than you need, although I love Ecamm. And then there's, oh, I wish Micah were here. There's the one I'm using, this the one he wrecked. He uses Ecamm at home. The one I'm using uh, is a little simpler. It's called Camo from a company called, yeah, heard, yeah, yes. from a company called Reincubate. It's at reincubate.com, and it will work just fine. It, it, it is basically Continuity Camera Plus, so it gives you a lot more control over it. I'm a very big fan, and that will absolutely continue to work on uh, the iPhone X. Um, you know, some features, you know, at some point, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I think it'll continue to work. They, it works with, I love camo. I use that instead of Continuity Camera. So uh, I would say what you do is you put the camo app on your phone and then you put camo studio on your Mac. By the way, it works with Windows too. I think we've showed this uh, working with Windows. The best camera you have probably, most people have, is your iPhone. Even an iPhone 10 is better than most, you know, net cams that you put on your computer. Most of you know, Logitech know, cams a, and stuff like that. Yeah, I've got a crappy Logitech it's, I think it's 1080p. It's yeah. just, but it's terrible. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Uh, camo, camo is fantastic. Um, it isn't free. I think there is a, actually there is a free version. Uh, yeah. And then for $50 a year, you can get the pro version, but, yeah. but you try it for free. Try it, put it on your, uh, put it on your iPhone 10 right now. I think you'll be very impressed. Uh, that's what is I it, use. Is it a, is it a subscription or? Uh, well, the free version is free forever. Uh, there are some things oh, it doesn't okay. do. The pro okay. is a $50 a year subscription. I, yeah, I right. pay for the pro. They do sell a lifetime license uh, for a hundred bucks. So if you just said, I just, I know I'm going to use this. Uh, I want to use it forever. A hundred bucks. And that yeah. lets you use well, it on two different computers. I'm not spending money on a, a new webcam because here's the old. You've got the mind. best webcam. It's better than it. Yeah. yeah. That, that's the, yeah, that's the not, Logitech, but let's go back to not the... Not nearly as good. The iPhone camera is remarkable, even in the iPhone 10, And it's better than the laptop. Look at that. The color's better. The sh the, oh, so the, much, yeah, the so lighting. So yeah. We don't use that Logitech anymore. I don't think you're going to need... I think con continuity will continue to work. Uh, it's not. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, now that you can't get iOS 17, it's not going to work. It'll continue to work. Um, so you don't, you don't need to worry about anything, but if it, for some reason it doesn't work to your satisfaction, there's always Ecamm and Camo, uh, and Camo is just, Ecamm is more for broadcasting. That's why Micah uses it for iOS today. You know, he can switch and stuff like that, but uh, Camo is everything you need. I use Camo at home and I love it. I have both actually, but I use okay. Camo. Well, I'll yeah. definitely look into that. I'll see. Cause I know it's, like I say, it's about time to pull the trigger on a new phone. It's, 
I keep the technology for a while, but after, you know, there's a point where. Like well, but this is a good use for, you know, you're going to get an iOS 15. I mean, iPhone 15, right. but this is, you You don't want to throw the 10 out. You, you got something you can right. do with it. And I know I'm not going to get much for a trade-in. They have, right. know Apple does the trade-in thing, but I, I can't imagine they'd give me any more than 10 bucks for it if they <laughs> give me anything. They might give you so, more than you think. There is a very brisk market in used phones. In fact, I just read an article about the company that does all of Apple's recycling, and they said they're still selling, I think they said 15,000 iPhone 8s every month. Uh, there's a brisk market in old iPhones because they're 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 still quality. They still work very Isn't well. Isn't that the SE uh, model that used that uh, eight? The SE did, did, but this is an actual iPhone eight because, it, oh. yeah. Okay. Uh, though, I'll find that article. It's a really interesting article about the company that basically uh, there were it was a two or three man company. They went to Apple and they said we would we would like to do all of your trade in recycling. And somehow they convinced them, and now it's a massive company with uh, uh, warehouses all over the world. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, it's a really interesting article. I think it was in the New York Times. We talked about it on um, Mac Break Weekly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm looking through my old uh, my old stories. I, I bookmark all these old stories, but can't find them. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was a very, I'll find it before the show's over. We'll put it in the show notes if you want to read about it. And yeah, they said, we sell a huge number of iPhone 8s. There's a massive market for that for some reason. Because uh, on the refer section, they, they only go back to 12s, I think. And it, and it doesn't make sense to buy any for me. Yeah. To buy anything. So that's what happens is, is uh, that's one of the reasons they sell a lot of these. Apple won't sell them. So Apple will sell the more recent ones. And, and the ones that Apple can't sell, this company gets. And, uh, and they sell them. And, and, you know, they have a marketplace. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was a really good article. Darn it, I just can't remember the, uh, the name of it. Anyway, I'll find it for you and, and put it in the well, show. Well, the good thing is also Here it is. still have the Alchemy. Where you can They're called Alchemy. Oh. They're in um, Ireland. Uh, and they, they do all of, when you do a trade in an Apple... They do all of the stuff. They 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 refurbish them. They have software uh, that does it. Um, when you trade in an Apple device, it's Alchemy's system that takes title from the consumer. They have the secondhand dealer license. They the, they use special software to immediately wipe the phone. Then they inspect and grade them. Uh, if it's an iPhone 8 that's not in great shape, it gets recycled using Daisy, which Apple, remember, that's the robot that Apple showed. It can disassemble 1.2 million phones a year, <laughs> 100,000 phones uh, a month. Um, Al Alchemy works more on the refurb side of the supply chain. Less than 1% of the goods it handles go to recycling. 99% get refurbished. Uh, at Alchemy Plants all around the world. Their Miami plant does 60,000 devices a month. I got the number wrong. Alchemy sells 15,000 iPhone 8s a day. Not a month, Ooh. a day. There Holy is a problem. brisk market. This is from TNW.com, uh, the next web.com. And uh, 300 employees, they made $442 million in revenue last year. <laughs> Apple gives them all the business. Alchemy. Wow. Yeah, it's a great story. Here is a picture. I want your your background next time you call. This is the Bellagio after they put up the grandstand. <laughs> oh, no. That's me right there. <laughs> no, oh, I don't know where I'll be I sitting. See you there. Yeah, yeah exactly. I don't know where I'll be sitting, but uh, that is that is going to be so much fun. I'll, uh, I'll well, wave at it's you. Okay. <laughs> Not a big Formula One fan, but uh, that's all right. I, I, it'll, I guess it'll bring in a lot of revenue. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, the Super Bowls are going to be crazy too, but nothing brings yeah. in the size. I, I don't think that this will be the biggest crowd Vegas has ever seen. Typically, the races, the the Miami race, the Austin race, Austin gets four hundred thousand people in one race weekend. So it is a massive influx. So basically, if I were you, I'd be out of town November 19th, I think it is. Uh, or hunkering, hunkering down. <laughs> <in the car. laughs> Don't leave the house. Hey, a no, real pleasure 
Thank you, Kevin. I'm glad to talk to an old time Mac fan. Oh, definitely, and an old uh, San Francisco uh, resident. Yeah. In fact, I going to just before COVID, I was going to come out to uh, see you guys there, but then of course that locked everything down, and yeah. then I retired and moved. We shut it I down. Went, oh no! Just oh, before no. I got a chance to see Mac Break Weekly in person, and a twit also. But okay, oh, don't well. don't tell anybody, but. If you let me know you're coming, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sneak you in the back way. All right. Well, next time I, I make a visit back to my old haunts up there in the Bay Area, I'll stop by. We keep, we don't there. have, the real problem is now it's not COVID so much anymore, although it's coming back apparently, uh, is that we would have to have a full-time staffer. We used to have Moses, the guard, and uh, we'd have to have a full-time staffer at the front door to welcome people to get them in, ushered in and stuff like that. And there's nobody manning the front door anymore. We don't. We're well, a also of, to make you feel at home. <gasps> There's the Golden Gate Bridge. which That's uh, where I would be coming across to see you. People, people come and say, wait a minute, it's not golden, it's orange. International uh, the next orange. time I come, it'll be, it'll be as a tourist instead of a resident. But uh, sometime in the future, we'll see. Great to talk to you, Kevin. Have a great day. Thanks. You. Thanks. You too. Take, Take care. Day. Coming up, speaking of cars, our car guy, Sam Abul Samad. He's a principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He hosts the wonderful Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media with Nicole Wakelin and my good friend Robbie. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Sam Abul Samad, our car guy. Hi, Sam. Hello. We missed Hello. you last last time. You were were you on vacation or were you out driving a car? No, uh, my wife and I and our dog uh, decided to take a long weekend away on the west Good. side of Michigan, Good. Uh, hanging out in a tiny little cabin um, and uh, had, a, had a lovely time. Everybody I, that I know in Michigan has a lake house or, you know, a, a, a cabin up by the lake. I, I guess that's the thing to do. Well, this wasn't ours. Uh, we, we just rented it. There's, there's actually a, a, a chain of uh, a place called Gate, uh, Getaway House. Oh, nice. um, and they have, they have these uh, little spots uh, tucked away in the woods. They have about 30 or so of these little cabins at, e at each of these locations. And it, it's got a, got a bed, a little kitchenette, shower and bathroom oh, inside. Like so you don't have to go to it. Use an outhouse. And the weather um, that time of year is perfect. The lake is beautiful. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. a good time to yeah. do that. Yeah. Well, I yeah. never let, never let work get in the way of a little getaway <laughs> with a, with a wife. I think that's a very important Absolutely. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what's up these days? Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about batteries, EV batteries. So, you know, it's um, funny that you should say this because I okay. just, I had my annual physical the other day and my doctor and I, did your doctor replace your batteries? No, but <laughs> for some reason, we spent at least, the nurse was giving him the stink eyes. She actually called and said, would you get Leo out of there? Because we start talking about electric vehicles and batteries. And he was he was asking me, what's the latest in battery tech? I heard there's new lithium ion batteries. I heard that there's companies that aren't, that are cha there, there's, there's new batteries that charge up very quickly. So what's the state of the art? Because this is, if we're going to move to EVs, this is the biggest pain point right now is you got to stop somewhere and it takes a half an hour to an hour to fill it up. So let's back up just a little bit. Uh, so first of all, lithium ion batteries, that is a very broad category that covers a lot of different types of battery chemistries in there. The one thing they have in common is that they have lithium in them. Uh, lithium, lithium atoms inside the, uh, the cells, the individual cells. And basically what happens is when you charge it up, the lithium, uh, the, the electrons are stripped off of the lithium atoms. They go out through, uh, through the, the, the circuit, uh, and go over to the anode and the lithium ions. So an ion is a positive, is a charged particle. Uh, normally an, an atom is, is neutral, so it's not positive or negative. So when you strip off an electron, the lith, what's left of the lithium becomes positively charged. That travels through the cell from the cathode to the anode, and it's, it gets embed, temporarily embedded in the, in the anode material, which in most cases is, on modern batteries is usually either graphite or a mix of graphite and silicon. Um, and then the cathode itself 
has some material is coated with some material that holds those lithium ions. And then when you discharge it, when you, when you run the, you know, take power from the battery, the electrons flow back from the anode through the circuit to the cathode and the lithium ions go back uh, through the cell and they reconnect. So the, the cathode material, when we talk about lithium ion chemistries, the cathode material is the chemistry that we're talking about there. And there's a bunch of different ones. Most of what you find today in EV batteries, at least in North America, um, is, are what we call nickel rich chemistries. And, and they use nickel usually in combination with cobalt, uh, maybe manganese or aluminum or both. Um, and, that's because the the nickel uh, rich cells have the highest energy density of the, the ones we have today. And that's what you want is you want a lot of energy density. You want as much energy stored in as little volume as possible um, and as little weight as possible. The problem is that chemistry that because you, you've actually got the cobalt is actually cobalt oxide. So it's cobalt, uh, cobalt dioxide. So cobalt with two oxygen uh, atoms on there. and when you've seen battery fires, what has happened is you've gotten a short circuit in the battery, either because maybe the battery's been punctured or damaged in some way, or there's a manufacturing defect. And um, it heats up when you get that short circuit and that cobalt oxide and the nickel um, release oxygen atoms. And so you get a combination of a lot of heat being released simultaneously. And it's also generating oxygen that can feed a fire and you know for for a fire you need three things you need fuel uh something that will combust uh oxygen and an ignition source and when you have a, a thermal runaway in a battery yikes that's what's happening and and so that's why it's really hard to extinguish a battery fire because you can't normally smother with, it because it's got its own yeah, oxygen it's generating the oxygen internally so you basically just have to let it burn itself out so Nickel is just one of the types. There's there's several others, but there's another one that is um, actually really interesting that it actually in China, about two thirds of all the EVs in China use this type. It's called lithium iron phosphate. So there's no nickel in it, no cobalt. This is, uh, this is lipo? Uh, yeah, uh, no. Uh, what What's referred to as lipo is lithium polymer which is actually another broad term, um, which can be any number of chemistries. The polymer is actually referring to the electrolyte. Most cells have a liquid electrolyte. Um, in lipo batteries, it's a polymer gel electrolyte. This is, this is really the fascinating because of all the technologies we use day to day, batteries have been the slowest to evolve. And uh -huh. this EV market has really driven them to some very interesting stuff. It's not life lipo, it's lifepo <laughs> or lifepo. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, okay. So yeah. So LFP. that's 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 different from lipo. So yeah. this is LFP. Yeah. So lithium iron phosphate. And if you, you know, if you're watching the the screen right now, you'll see that the, the chemistry there, you know, the phosphate is PO4, which is oxygen with four atom or phosphorus with four oxygen atoms attached. So okay. what happens with this is if you damage the cell in some way and it starts to uh, get, it gets a short circuit, it will release O4 instead of O2. Okay. Well, O4 won't contribute to a fire. Oh, interesting. So the, the beauty of this is um, basically it's, it's essentially resistant to thermal runaway. Um, so right. it's much, much safer than nickel rich batteries. And, on top of that, iron, one it's of the cheap. most common elements on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, most of our planet is made of iron. Yeah. Phosphorus is also very, uh, very common, very prevalent. It's available everywhere. And uh, oxygen is fairly common as well. Uh, so it's the materials, the raw materials for this are much cheaper than for nickel rich batteries. And it's safe and it's extremely stable. There is, however, one slight downside. Oh, there's always a downside. Yes. Yeah. So the, um, the, the energy density of an LFP cathode is about usually about 30% or so less than a nickel rich oh, cathode. Okay. Uh, so that would mean bigger you know, battery, all, less power, all things, yeah. all things equal. You'd have about 30% less range. Yeah. That's not, however, great. there are ways to get around this problem. 
Uh, and so um, one of the by the way, the LSPs changes, are used in uh, Model Threes and Model Ys uh, from Texas. In, in the standard range Model Three, yeah. Or sorry, the standard range Model Three, um, not, and also not the high di high range because for what you just described. Right. Yeah. And and that that's in North America. In other markets, in Europe and in China, they use it in both the Model 3 and the Model Y for the okay. standard range versions. Okay. And that's actually the best selling version of the Model Y. Right. Uh, and the Model 3 is the LFP version, uh, particularly in China, uh, because, you know, they're they're more price conscious. Fires are more price conscious there. So this is good. So, this means we'll see fewer vehicle out of control vehicle fires with EVs as yep. this uh, starts to take over. So let me let me talk a little bit about how we get around that energy density problem. And that is what we call a cell to pack architecture. If you look at typical modern EV batteries today, they they use a modular setup. So the cells are installed into a box we call a module. And then those modules are installed into a bigger box. So you got a box in a box. And as you've talked about many times over the years, going back to when uh, Apple started um, getting rid of removable or replaceable batteries in their laptops and then did that with the iPhones. The reason why they do that is because when you have a battery that you can remove, you th that ha that has a, a casing around it and there's a structure in, in the, the device as well. Those take up physical space. If you get rid of those and just put the cell directly in there, you can put a bigger cell in because you're not using up space for this packaging. The packaging is the and, phone or the car. Right. Yeah. And, and so in this case, um, modular EV batteries take up, um, you know, the, the modules take up a bunch of volume within that pack. Um, and so if you look at a typical modular battery pack today for an EV, only about 30 to 35 percent of the volume of that pack is actually um, active cell material that's storing energy, which is pretty poor. Yeah, you know, and you think about how how big these packs are. Basically, a third of it is actually storing energy. The rest is just these boxes and and other associated components, and that also adds to the cost of the battery. So, what we're starting to see now is a shift to what we call a cell to pack architecture. So, you get rid of the modules because you know they found that the the batteries are actually durable enough and reliable enough. They last long enough that the reason they used the modules in the first place was to enable enable serviceability. So if you had a problem, you could pull out the pack, remove a module, replace the module. And that's in fact what they did to your Chevy Bolt um, is, right. and, and when new, they did the battery pack. recall, yeah. they yeah. tested every module and they only replaced the modules that were suspect. Oh, interesting. Instead of okay. replacing the entire pack. Smart. Okay. Um, and, but for the most part, they, they don't really need to do that. So they're moving to cell to pack. So they just, st they just stack all the, the cells directly in the box, in the, in the big box, glue them together. Um, in some cases like uh, Tesla's uh, 4680 uh, structural pack, because uh, they're using cylindrical cells that have, when you pack in a bunch of cylinders, you're going to have space in between the cylinders. They're filling it with a structural foam to, to bond everything together. But when you do that, um, especially if you have prismatic cells, rectangular cells, you can really fill up the space in the pack with cells. And um, there's a company here in Michigan called Our Next Energy, or One, that is doing this now. Uh, they're 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 delivering uh, their current Aries battery pack. It's a lithium ion iron phosphate battery pack. Uh, that now the the fill ratio of active material in there is about seventy five percent. So you've doubled the amount wow. of active material in the in the same size pack. More than compensating for the thirty percent loss in capacity. Right, that's and great. A, cu a couple of years ago, they took a, a Tesla Model S. One, you know, when they first started up, they built their first prototype pack and they put it in a Model S. So they used the same package dimensions, battery pack dimensions, as a standard Model S battery, but they filled it with their LFP cells in in this cell to pack format. Mm -hmm. So no modules. And they put it in there. So even even though the iron phosphate has a lower direct energy density, because they were able to put so more so much more of it in the pack, they were able to drive it to northern Michigan and back again, seven hundred and fifty two miles on a single charge. That's pretty good. That's okay. <laughs> like double what I get, or more than double what I get right now. 
Yeah, that's and, fantastic. I mean, the, the, sta- the standard the standard Model S, you know, with its factory, you know, its original Tesla battery pack would go a little over three hundred miles. Although we know Tesla this one, exaggerates some of the range, but still, yeah, but apples to apples, you know, they went they went seven hundred and fifty two miles real world driving on a single charge with this. Yeah, well, I remember when I got my Model X, uh, they showed us the eighteen sixty six fifties that they put in there, and they look like regular, you know. Duracell batteries without yeah, they're any cylindrical branding. They're ba- cells. Cylindrical cells. Cylindr- they're they're and you can a little bit larger than a double A. Cylinders don't pack very well. There's lots of empty space. You could see how, uh, you know, that would not be the most efficient way to pack in batteries. Now, yeah, I have I mean, to it, ask you. It's always you, a trade-off, though, because the, the cylindrical cells are cheaper to manufacture. Sure. Um, then and a, they're a easily replaced one by cell. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got to ask you though, if we're talking about this, and this is what my doctor wanted to know: what about these uh, solid state batteries from Toyota? They charge in ten mi- minutes and go seven hundred forty-five miles. Is that you know? Um, I remember, by the way, <laughs> Toyota's first EVs they had to recall them because the wheels fell off. So I'm not yeah. gonna necessarily <laughs> believe anything Toyota says. Credible. Well, yes and no. So, um, you know, these, these solid state cells, the, so the difference between what a solid state cell and what we have today, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier lipo, you know, or po- polymer, lithium polymer, um, the electrolyte that they put in the, in the um, cells that allows the ions to travel back and forth between the anode and the cathode um, today is a liquid or, um, or a gel. And, um, that also, and when you get overheating, there's also oxygen released from that. Uh. And so that's a problem. What they're doing with these, um, solid state cells is they're replacing it with a conductive ceramic material, solid ceramic material. So once you inject it in there and it cures, it becomes a solid. So now you pot- you potentially have a battery, uh, a cell that, it, you know, it can't, can't have a short circuit. The way you can uh, with if you have an uh, a, a gel or liquid electrolyte because every it's one solid it becomes one solid block and so there's no way for the anode and the cathode to ever come in contact. You may already have if you have a pacemaker that's they're using those solid state batteries today. Right. the The problem with solid state cells, yes, they do work really really well and they have they can have very high energy density. Um, and they can charge really fast. You can get a lot of power out of them. The problem is actually scaling up the manufacturing, yeah. uh, building them in enough volume to do EVs. And so this is where everybody has struggled. Uh, back, I don't know if you remember, uh, probably six or seven years ago, Dyson wanted to build an EV. Um, and they, uh, when they started their EV project, they bought um, a, a company here in Ann Arbor where I am, it was, it came out of uh, university of Michigan, um, that had been developing solid state batteries. Um, and it, they, you know, they bought it because they wanted that technology. So they, they bought them. Um, and the problem is like everybody that's been doing solid state, they have not been able to get it to scale up, uh, to scale the manufacturing process to the point where it's actually usable. So yeah, it solid state batteries can work in very small cells, very small volumes, um, but for the number, for the uh, quantity that you need for EVs, they still haven't figured out how to actually manufacture those in large format cells and large vo- high volumes. So Toyota is claiming around 2027, 20, 28. Um, there's you know a bunch of companies doing this and all making similar claims. We'll see. Um, you know, it's it's still you know most most companies are saying yeah probably late this decade we'll start to see some solid solid state batteries. By the way, fun fact: the first solid state uh, batteries uh, were invented uh, by the late John Goodenough. He just passed away uh, in June at the age of 101. Uh, he was a brilliant battery scientist. We can thank him for a lot of what we know about batteries and a lot of the battery inventions. And he was the first to suggest a solid state uh, EV style battery. Uh, so yeah, there's hope, we'll, there's hope, but it's yeah. not around the corner yet. Yeah. Is, but is, even, I mean, the LFP before we get is to the, the best bet in the long run. In, certainly in the, in the near term, 
uh, near to midterm. Um, we're going to start seeing, you know, Tesla said, you know, you mentioned already is uh, shipping the standard range Model 3 with an LFP battery pack um, this fall, the 2024 model year um, Mach-E. Uh, like your car, the standard range version of that is getting an LFP pack. Oh, good. The F-150 Lightning is getting one early next year. Um, and Ford is building a very large uh, LFP production plant um, here in Michigan uh, that should be online in 2026. Uh, GM just announced an investment in a, in a Silicon Valley company, a materials company that's developing some interesting LFP uh, chemistries. Um, and you're going to see a lot more LFP. As I said two thirds of the EVs in China are already using LFP batteries uh, and a bunch of them in, in Europe. And you're going to start seeing a lot more of them here in North America over the next couple of years as well, because it's so much cheaper. It's about 30 30 to 40% cheaper than nickel rich cells. Um, and when you use this kind of structural architecture or cell to pack architecture, it becomes, uh, you know, you, you can get, you can recover, you can basically get to parity with um, the uh, energy density of nickel cells at a much lower cost. Uh, and it's safer. Uh, you'll never have a thermal runaway. And another thing, they also last a lot longer. They oh. go and a, a nickel, a nickel cell, can do about 800, eight to 900 charge cycles. LFP cells can do thousands of charge cycles. Interesting. Um, so when so they'll be good heard, for, bad, for laptops and smartphones as well. Yeah. You may have heard, you know, in the past, Elon talk about, you know, a million mile battery. Yeah. That's what he's talking about is LFP. Interesting. Uh, LFP cells can conceivably last a million miles. Um, I so guess they're you not ideal LFP for a, a phone or a laptop though, because battery life would be lower. yeah there you're you're much more size volume constrained right um and you know so that that energy density you know you, you don't really want to sacrifice that energy density in a handheld device because you already got as much vehicle as you're ever gonna yeah have, yeah in, in a vehicle it's it's a little little easier sam abul sam at principal researcher at guidehouse insights listen to the wheel bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media and uh every month here it's always a good thing to see you uh good to see you too leo yeah, i'm glad you took a little time off but i'm glad we could get you back thanks sam yep uh, thank you have a great one all right you're watching ask the tech guys with just one it's half the half the tech guys half the fun more in a moment i think uh i haven't you know i haven't done all day should i do a phone another phone call and then i'll do some email i see i see uh somebody on the uh on the horn, on the heater, on the blower. How many f different names do we have for... Did I pick up the wrong one? It looks like it was on the horn, heater, blower. <laughs> Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from, sir? Uh, I'm Cliff from Colton. Hi, Cliff from Colton. Colton where? Colton what state? Col Colton, California. Okay. I imagine there's Coltons in other areas, so I just wanted to clarify that. Cliff, Cliff what can You're I probably do? Probably right. <laughs> what can I do for you, Cliff? Well, a buddy of mine uh, is having to re is having to uh, put his uh, website on the shelf. Oh. He's been trying to develop it, and he asked me to try to back it up. Mm. And um, um, it is on Amazon Web Services. Really? <laughs> Do you know of any? Yeah. That's an that's interesting. Where, that's where he, he. That's where he hosted. It. It's where it's hosted now. So a website is actually a very simple thing to back up because a website really is uh, a bunch of text files, uh, HTML and CSS, and then whatever media is included. But it's all just a bunch of files. That are sitting in one or more folders uh, at the uh, at the root of the of the uh, server f directory. So that's it's, why. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, just going to say that's why I initially didn't think anything of it. I think go up there with an FTP client and grab it. Yeah. But uh, but uh, this Amazon Web Services is, is insane because. They want you to back it. They really want you to back it up online. Yeah, because they because they sell. What do they sell? Hard drive storage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, and it has been 
He, when he says he wants you to back it up, does he mean back it up so that he could at some point in the future host it somewhere else? Correct, because he he spent a lot of money on this. They they put I, he he's not he does he didn't write it himself. He paid for India to do it, and okay, there's a lot of uh, art AI in it, and uh, apparently it's it's fairly advanced. And because, like, when he downloaded it from them to begin with, uh, they, they're they the ones who transferred it to Amazon Web Services. But when he downloaded it from them to begin with, it was that what he has is uh, everything on it is identified as a Trojan. Yeah. So, uh, it's, so it's, he's got a more complicated website, which has code on it uh, and, yes. and is running a code engine. And I don't know what language it is, probably PHP, but it might be other stuff as well. So it is a. I would guess PHP. Yeah, it's a more complicated site. So, um, I mean, all of that still is sto stored as text files. It sounds like Amazon doesn't support FTP into it, but there must be other ways of getting those files from a. In fact, it should be easier because it's AWS to to get to the files that are on that drive and just copy them. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, I mean, if you had another AWS account that was yours, uh, and it's easy to set one up and it's free, and maybe get an S3 get some S3 storage, you could probably easily copy it over there. The Amazon wants you to do that. And once it's in your own S3 bucket, it would be easy to download it, to copy it, and uh, and get it all that way. I was going to show well, then you... Why can't, why, can't, why can't I just copy his bucket? Well, that's what I'm saying. You're going to copy his bucket to, you, to your bucket <laughs> and then get it. He yeah. could copy it. If I, I'm sure he can copy it. Um. I'm I'm going to ask our uh, esteemed uh, team tech guy in the IRC and Discord if anybody has uh, AWS and how can you does AWS not support ST, S, FTP or FTP? Did you you tried they, FTP? They, and say they, they, they say they kind of do, but uh, it's it, it was a nightmare trying to trying to get the information out of them. Yeah, they don't want to do it. In other words. Right. <laughs> but yeah. they can't not let you do it, obviously. You have the right to access it. Let me uh, just see. Uh, AWS SFTP. Uh, AWS transfer is what they want you to do. Um, but I, I wonder if this transfers. Can you transfer it to local? Map your domain to the server endpoint. Select authentication. Integrate your... So to transfer the data, um, this is looks like this transfer is from one S3 to bucket to another S3 bucket. So that's a fully managed. I'm just looking at different ways you can you can do it. They do support SFT, SFTP, uh, and they want you to use transfer because that's you know keeping it in the family. But if you want to download everything. Um, your Mike B has found a little article. Let's take a look at this. Create an SFTP enabled server. The other way to do it is if it supports SSH, we were talking about that earlier, secure shell. SSH creates a tunnel that you could then use SCP or secure copy over it and literally copy the files. So, that would be the next thing to do is, can I SSH into this uh, bucket? Frankly, I prefer SCP to FTP. So rather than do this, all this fancy thing, ask your friend, is he is he giving you credentials to log in? I've got all the credentials. Okay. He, he knows nothing. Yeah, yeah. So you don't need to ask him. I am sure they support SSH. <laughs> I mean... And if they if they do, you SSH into it. Now you're looking at it as it's as is as if it's a local hard drive, and you can use SCP, which has a uh, uh, syntax very similar to SSH, to copy 
you SCP the server name and the file. You can use star dot star if you want. And, and, and then you say to my local drive and you should be able to copy everything. Try, I think you probably don't want to use the services, the managed services that Amazon provides. Cause I think oh, those, I, I was pulling my hair out. Trying yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they, you're exactly right. Do not really want to make that easy, but I, I think that's where I would approach it. This is the second call. Okay. I would have thought it. Second call about SSH. But I think SSH on AWS, they must have an SSH port uh, that they uh, let you connect to, and then you could download everything from that. Um, yeah, I'm looking at some. How to SSH to an EC2 instant on Amazon. Connect to EC2. That's the Elastic Computing Server. Um, I bet you that they support it. So look at the documentation for whatever AWS service he's using. See if you can turn on SSH. If you can, then you're going to SSH. You're actually not going to even use SSH. You're going to use SCP, which is copying over SSH. You're going to SCP space server name file file name. That's the start, and then you're going to put the destination, the source, and the destination. I think you should be able to do that. Do you know if he's using what he's using? Is it EC2? Is it LightSail? This is the other problem. Is AWS has a bunch of services. S3, there are a bunch of different services. I think he's using S3. Okay. I I would be shocked if they didn't have SSH in there. In fact, if you log into his uh, Amazon console, I bet you you can see the SSH service and. Make sure that's turned on and then and then use SCP to copy it. And that would well, be thank you very, very intuitive and normal and fast and simple. I was going to show you, but as soon, until you mentioned the AI, I was going to show you a tool that Andy showed me that is really great for copying websites. But this is more for copying so you can read them offline. Uh, this is an add-on for Mozilla called Single File. The problem is it would not get the code. So if he's got code running on his site php or other code running on a site it's not going to get that it's going to get all the other files of the html etc cetera, etc cetera. uh he probably should be aware if he went to somebody and got somebody to design this it's probable that it uses code blobs on their server i'm going to bet javascript and and other code blobs that he might not have access to without an account with them that's how they keep you in there in their fold so this is the yeah. Apparently, apparently the people who uh, who designed the thing uh, uh, did the complete migration to uh, Amazon Web Services. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> that that means yeah, it well, runs right. on it. It runs on AWS. But you know, this was the problem. Even going back to things like Microsoft's front page, was these proprietary code blobs that you really couldn't run, you couldn't just move it to another server. A good, a well-designed website, you should be able to take it, put it somewhere else, and it should be able to run. Um, but these guys who are web design services don't want you to do that, and they may well have done something proprietary that you can't just transport over. So don't give them false hope. Maybe, maybe that's the case, but give it a try. Does he no longer have a contract with them and, and it still works? Uh, he, it, it works for the time being. It'll be down at the end of the month. <laughs> yeah. And even if you copy it, it may still be down because they, as I said, it may call stuff on their server that they're no longer going to give you access to. That's true. That's the risk. Uh, that's why you, you should always use a non proprietary You can, it's fine to use third party designers, but they should, they should give you something that runs for, like our website, twit.tv. We went to a wonderful company in uh, texas four kitchens to design it but we don't have to have four kitchens service it it's it's a thing they gave us and we can run it somewhere else now uh without their uh involvement and that's i think really important anyway try the ssh route i think i can't believe amazon doesn't offer that on aws they've got to thank you thank you very much i've been listening to you for for a year since the beginning so. thank you cliff i'm so it's glad you called it's a really pleasure pleasure. talking to you thank very you a lot of fun. I have to say, we got really geeky on this show. I think it's the geekiest one we've done without Micah Sargent here to bring us down to earth. I hope we didn't leave you all uh, hanging, but you know, this is how you learn, right? It, it all, you know, I mean, this is how we all learn. 
when I first started doing this, none of it made sense. Still doesn't make sense in many cases. You just keep banging on it. And eventually it all comes clear and, and it'll make sense. Uh, Mike will feel better soon. Mike will be back, if he does, on Tuesday for iOS Today. Even if he doesn't, as long as he can talk. We're worried about him losing his voice. He's apparently lost his voice. But, uh, but if he can talk, he'll be on iOS Today on Tuesday. And, of course, Tech News Weekly on Thursday. I will be back on Tuesday with Mac Break Weekly and Security Now. And, of course, we do this show every Sunday uh, with or without Micah. And, you know, Micah does it without me. I do it without him. That's why we got two of us. <laughs> we do the show uh, Sundays, 11 a.m. Well, all right, 11, 11 a.m. to 1.35 p.m. But we'll make it 11 to 2. How about that? <laughs> that is uh, 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, 2100, I'm sorry, 1800 UTC. You can watch us do it live if you wish. Uh, that way you can call in, right, if you're watching live uh, at IR, I'm sorry, <laughs> live.twit.tv, live.twit.tv. There are live audio and video streams there. If you are watching live, you can absolutely chat with us live in our IRC. That's where the team tech guy lives, including Mike B and Scooter X and Reverb Mike, who hates it when I tell people that somebody died he doesn't like to hear that doesn't like to hear that nobody dies in his life uh and uh and all the other folks uh irc.twit.tv open to all you can use your browser to go there now i do mention from time to time our other team tech guy behind the velvet rope there are the people in the discord they are the club twit members now this is an elite core of the very smartest, brightest, best people in the family. We want you to join, too. Open to you only. Don't tell anybody about it at uh, twit.tv slash club twit. Okay, yes, there is a slight charge for membership, $7 a month. But look at all the benefits. Ad-free versions of this show and all of our other shows. Access to the Discord. We've reorganized the Discord to make it even more fun. Great place to hang out and chat. It's a wonderful community. Plus shows we don't put out anywhere else. Micah Sargent's hands-on Macintosh. We got hands-on Windows with Paul, little Pauly Therat. We've got uh, the Untitled Linux show with Johnny Bennett. <laughs> yeah, the Giz Fizz with Dickie D. We've got all sorts of great shows, including little Scotty Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks. It's back in the club. All of that because of our wonderful members whose seven bucks a month goes towards supporting those projects, keeping the lights on here, keeping the staff employed. None of it goes into my pocket. It all goes into uh, into the projects, the, the programming here at Twit. We really appreciate your membership. If you're not a member yet, please. Actually, I know you're not because you wouldn't hear this if you were a member. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. Ah, this Week in Tech is coming up next. We've got a great show planned for you, so stick around if you're watching live. Otherwise, I will see you next week on Ask the Tech Guys. Have a great geek week. Bye-bye. Hey, I know you're super busy, so I won't keep you long, but I wanted to tell you about a show here on the Twit Network called Tech News Weekly. You are a busy person, and uh, during your week, you may want to learn about all the tech news that's fit to well, say, not print, here on Twit. It's Tech News Weekly. Uh, me, Micah Sargent, my co-host, Jason Howell. We talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news, and we love the opportunity to get to share those stories with you and let the people who wrote them or broke them share them as well. So I hope you check it out every Thursday right here on Twit. Twit.